Nu tā, labdien visiem. Ja jūs man lēnām sākat dzirdēt, tad jums ir viss kārtībā. Hello, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. If you hear me, then it means that everything is uh, as it should be with the sound. However, if you don't hear me, then you need to adjust uh, the sound on your computer or other device. If you use Zoom on your computer, then you can also use interpretation. Just checking uh, if you don't uh, listen to uh, interpreter's um, uh, speech, then you might be on Latvian channel, which means technically you should click to another channel in this Zoom options. Uh, and uh, there are options in English, so for those who do not command uh, fully Latvian, but anyway, you can make a choice. You can learn Latvian as well. Not only a great subject of nuclear energy, so how to introduce this in Latvia. Maybe it is even inventable. So anyway, I'm switching back to Latvian. As you understand, I simply informed everybody that uh, interpreting is available. This is an inter international conference, so everybody can choose either or to listen to the original speech or listen to interpreting in Latvian or English. We will talk today about um, various scientific inventions and we will have uh, highly honorable lecturers and speakers among us. There will be different people from different scientific fields who will talk about myths and beliefs regarding uh, nuclear energy. Nuclear energy is uh, quite famous, or want to say infamous. Somebody say it is not the greenest or the cheapest solution at the moment. It is all the time standing on crossroads. 20 years ago, I, as a journalist, was in Brussels and I filmed uh, a news report on solar energy and somebody said it is not uh, something that could be deployed while we are alive. It could simply probably be deployed or introduced in 200, within 200 years of time. But uh, nowadays we widely use solar energy and probably also nuclear energy could be introduced and deployed with no time. Uh, I would like to thank all the organizers who have developed such an inter interesting agenda. They not only have chosen very exciting and interesting presentations, but they have also made calculations. And according to the calculations, around 7 million gigaw gigawatts are necessary for Latvia to meet all our energy consumption. Most likely we will use electricity for many things also in the future. And this conference is happening thanks to electricity. A power supply company Latvenergo is also among our supporters and sponsors, sponsors as well as hosts of this conference. But there are many interesting conversations and discussions planned for this conference. If you use Zoom application, you can also ask us questions. You can ask them in chat section of Zoom. Uh, write uh, also the addressee, which uh, speaker should answer your question. Probably if uh, discussions are very heated and it takes a lot of time, then um, we won't be able to follow the chat section, but we will try to answer all the questions uh, as much as possible. Uh, some of you have connected uh, to the conference uh, in Delphi. It is an in internet portal and it is also related uh, to different data protection issues. But we will talk a lot, a lot about data, so please follow the data information we tell. This will be the first attempt of explaining the role and meaning of the nuclear energy to broader society. Latvia is also considering nu nuclear energy as a, pos a potential solution for future. Uh, our Ministry for Economics is uh, in quite a stable Oh, sorry, in quite an unstable position. We want, we don't know whether he will be minister in the upcoming months or not, but he has recorded his speech and uh, please listen to him.
He is also our Ministry for Energy. Ladies and gentlemen, dear participants of the conference dedicated to nuclear energy, I would like to thank you for participating in this format in today's conference. This is an unprecedented event in the field of nuclear energy in Latvia. I would say it is still in baby steps here. There have been different speculations or opinions on the usefulness and necessity for this of this source of energy and its uh, usability in the future. But we haven't had in-depth expert analysis and discussions yet. I am positive regarding this source of energy we have had also national agreement this first di dynasty in in the us i don't think that capacity of other renewable sources of energy like wind or solar energy could be increased significantly in the future these sources of energy are quite unstable as they need to be balanced there are different visions regarding what is considered a modern contemporary power plant to, to meet our modern needs. At the moment, all the discussions are still theoretical, but the things you are doing at the moment, that you, that you have organized this uh, conference and uh, you are ready and willing to discuss the role and national position of the of the nuclear energy then great things are ahead of us we could involve our scientists and technical minds and this is simply the first initial signal this is a signal to to make us all go in the right direction and if we are lucky and if all things happen the way they should and if it is economically feasible then we should definitely move towards uh, nuclear energy attieksmi tas gal galā visdrīzāk nemainīsies pat ja mums pieeikšņi mainās valdības sastāvs tuvākajā laikā problēmu paliks i would like to thank minister for his uh, for his address most likely the situation in energy field in Latvia won't change in the upcoming future so dramatically. We should use our scientific potential and look for different ideas how to solve our energy issues and um, ensure energy security in the future. There have been uh, more than 300 particip participants who have uh, applied for this conference, and one of uh, and one of our partners and sponsors is Fermi Energy. That is one of the agents. It is one of the agencies that uh, that bases its operations on uh, on uh, detailed scientific calculations and uh, perspectives. Um, also, different scientific institutes and the representatives have joined this event. Among the participants, there are also several NGOs, General Atomic World, Atomic Association, International Movement, Stand Up for Nuclear, and University of Latvia Institute for Solid State Physics. These are just some of our participants. All of us together will be held by the training center for development innovations. That is a foundation that tries to tackle different myths and misbeliefs related to nuclear energy. This organization is aimed at public awareness raising and one of the people that could be in the best position to clarify different myths and misbeliefs is vice president of latvian academy of sciences and also the laureate of for the grand medal of the scientific academy mr maris stenbergs i would like to give the floor to to uh, uh, Andri Sternbergs, but before that, I would like to give the floor to Mr. Minister of Defense, uh, Artis Fabrics. 
I thought it's enough with one minister, but now we have a recorded speech of another minister. It is Minister of Defense. Nuclear energy is also an issue of defense. If you have food security and if you if, if state has new energy security, it's a welfare state. Here, attendees, according to the analysis by experts, there are three types of resources in the world that are very important. We can't go on without them and we are fighting over them. That is food. We see it now with the Russian attack on Ukraine. That is water, which we have a lot of in Latvia, and that is, of course, energy. In the case of Latvia, energy or acquisition of energy is one of the most critical questions. Even if we have a lot of food and water, we're not so lucky with energy. If we take a look at natural resources, uh, here's how our future looks like. Firstly, this energy is not sufficient for us. We need heating, we need industry, we need manufacturing, and it all must be clean and so that we do not pollute the environment. We must leave Russian gas behind. We cannot rely on a neighbor where the economy is subordinate to different political, geopolitical, or imperial ambitions. So what are we left with? We are left with our hydropower, we have, of course, our forests that we can produce wood chips and pellets and uh, use them both for heat and heating. We are left with modern green energy, which is used more and more in European countries and all over the world. And of course, that's wind and solar, but that is not sufficient in my opinion. And here, I think we should return to using nuclear nuclear energy in the Baltic region, uh, but on a new scale and in a modern way. If we want to be modern, developed, clean, and if we want for this energy, heat and electricity to be provided independently, regardless of sufficient uh, wind or sunshine, I don't see any reasonable uh, alternative uh, other than nuclear energy. And in my opinion, given the fact that we're not a large power, it would be best to do so along with one of our neighbors. I believe that there's a similar type of modern thinking in our neighboring country of Estonia. I know that among our partners in Sweden or Canada or elsewhere, we can find many economical business offers which would help us create a mutual agreement on the modern and safe use of nuclear energy for the needs of our economy or society and in a way that is ecologically clean. From this perspective, I will definitely be one of the politicians that will support this development in our energy policy. And I hope that among the listeners, there are both uh, thinkers and doers who could uh, work together in order to move us ahead. So that we here in Latvia would have not only a lot of water, not only a lot of food, but a lot of green energy, which wouldn't make us dependent on other countries, uh, especially unfriendly ones. Thank you very much. Uh, yet in the situation of war, if it's, uh, if it's makes things more unclear. Remember, there was this uh, statement about uh, Chernobyl and Zaporizhia, the nuclear reactors. Everybody in, in the world uh, had their hearts beating faster. Uh, so you should definitely take these into account in your lecture. Today we talked about uh, uh, Russia saying uh, that Finland doesn't want to pay for natural gas in rubles. And of course, Finland has applied for NATO. So this energetic uh, pressure might be a part that interests us. Uh, Russia said, Russia was one of them, the ones that said that uh, Finland, oh, why are you building nuclear reactors? Of course, all of these questions, uh, you should definitely uh, present them to us, put them on the map. And don't remember, of course, the Latvian national interests are above all, and we're putting uh, the central stones for our buildings. Yesterday on TV, I saw some information on Zaporizhia, and uh, 
So there will definitely be some allusions to that. So our not prism of our national interests uh, here. So, so thank you very much. Thank you, Ansi, for the introduction on the, the in institute and all the ministers who uh, gave a great introduction to this lecture. And uh, this uh, political support makes it much easier to speak. But of course, we will be talking from a point of view of science. As you can see, I've said, added two uh, th linked themes. So energy challenges during the energy crisis and critical climate change and green. And the second point is uh, green nuclear energy as a long term solution for baseload capacity. And that applies especially well for Latvia. And on the top, I've added uh, that a lot has to do with uh, the work of scientists to develop the understanding of where we're going, how we're improving the uh, uh, sources of energy. And we'll be talking about alternative resources. We should remember that the environment uh, is very important as well. And my uh, main uh, thesis is that uh, green energy is one of the long-term solutions. Did the slide change? Yes, it did. So maybe I will start with, since I'm a phys uh, physicist, I'll start with the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2021, which was obtained by these scientists, which were linked to climate change. And they showed that one of the main topics in uh, climate change is how, how to lower uh, carbon dioxide emissions, which is very important, which uh, is something we should work on together. So that was one of the main questions in the Glasgow conference. So it's, it's quite slow here, the presentation. Okay, so that's what I just uh, mentioned. So Again, the slides are going very slowly. Okay, so on the Glasgow conference, uh, one of the main goals was to say that we must understand that in the coming years, so till 2030, we must uh, lower the temperature changes. They should be lower than 1.5 degrees per decade. And in the bottom, I've added that uh, one of the goals that should be kept in uh, parallel is uh, uh, the transition uh, to a zero carbon or low carbon economy and technologies and manufacturing and everywhere else. This was already talked about, alluded to by Pabrix, the Minister of Defense. So on achieving a sustainable energy future, first of all, it's solar cells and uh, solar generators, solar wind generators, and lastly, we uh, we started to understand that uh, hydrogen energy energy can be collected with hydrogen as well. So there are projects developed in Latvia, uh, which combine wind generators and and uh, H2 fuel cells. And we must under remember that Latvia has a huge advantage now that we use the dog of a river and we use uh, hydroelectric plants and there's a status uh, we've obtained as one of the top users of uh, hydro energy and lastly of course a vision of the future uh, perhaps we might <laughs> collect dark energy in the future Moving on, I wanted to talk about what are the main things in uh, energy. It is storage as well, not only acquisition of energy. So here we talk about lithium batteries for, and but other batteries as well. For example, uh, uh, so lithium is uh, quite catastrophic for the environment. Of course, there are super capacitors as well. And as I said, uh, hydrogen can be used for storage as well, a storage of energy. And another thing, the economy uh, 
is concerned with how we best use the energy and using it the least amount possible. So uh, all electric appliances are going for lower electricity consumption, for example, LEDs and OLEDs as well. We do not use uh, standard old light bulbs. And of course, uh, energy efficient housing is important as well. For example, smart windows, uh, which control the uh, entering and exit of energy with the thermochromic effects. And another thing, we see fossil fuels here, the minister already referred to them. So we should find a way we could replace the fossil energy sources. So it should be go hand in hand with uh, <clears throat> replacing them with green uh, green sources. So and one of the sources, of course, can be nuclear energy. And this is uh, just a general slide where uh, I just want to stress something I already said, that two thirds of all the energy supply uh, will be uh, gained from green sources by 2050. But to compensate for the loss of power with fossil fuels uh, exiting the picture, we must double the amount of nuclear energy we receive. Of course, uh, just a short, uh, short equation, the short equations, two types of uh, obtaining nuclear energy. So nuclear fission is the first one. And the second one is the future. Uh, it's I'll talk, be talking about it a bit less. So it will be nu nuclear fusion, which is something that happens on the sun. And sun, the sun is essentially at the top of all our energy sources. For example, wind, fossil fuels, as I refer to, as I tell my students as well. And without the sun, we cannot exist. And nature cannot exist without uh, the sun. So that's why we should uh, uh, cooperate, so to say, with uh, nature and the environment. We shouldn't attack it too much and destroy it too much. Uh, so uh, with the renewable uh, resources, sometimes there can actually be damage to the environment. So really old, uh, <clears throat> old uh, slide I have here, uh, it says that if there is a future, it will be green, said by Petra Kelly from Germany. So let's not go into too many details about the picture as well. Of course, at the basis of everything, the fundamentals of, uh, of, uh, of this question is uh, radioactivity uh, research. And of course, Albert Einstein uh, this is the first recording, so to say, of E equals MC squared. So it says that uh, <clears throat> mass and energy are one and the same physical unit and can be transformed into each other. So if I refer to fission, if we perform fission, we lower the mass. But in fusion, we heighten it. So, but in either way, it results in a huge uh, expulsion of energy. I won't be talking too much about this uh, cycle, but it's the fission cycle. Of course, we can talk about it in a more scientific context in a different conference, how uranium is used and how it goes through the cycle. And so uranium, uh, enriched uranium is uh, split and it splits when it reaches its critical mass and that produces neutrons, which form a chain reaction and the process continues and it's clear that afterwards uh, something, an element is heated up, for example, steel is heated up and that results into steam and of course that's the way uh, the nuclear reactor works in short. Of course, they're all thermic uh, energy uh, sources, which is uh, transformed into uh, electricity. So this is the general principle of how the nuclear power plant works. Of course, there can be different types of power plants. 
of nuclear power plants, but the uh, end principle is one and the same. It's so, uh, for example, there are uh, different types of uh, reactors, for example, uh, pressurized water uh, reactors. There are different tricks and types uh, that you can uh, heighten efficiency of these uh, reactors. So, like I said, the main types of power plants uh, so the pressurized water reactor, boiling water reactor, one of the simplest ones is the boiling water uh, reactor, which actually will be used in Estonia, which is uh, similar to a Canadian reactor. And like I mentioned, the heavy water reactor. And there's a fast breeder reactor where the fuel is put into the next cycle and as the uranium is used uh, much more efficiently. And again, I believe it's stated here that the nuclear power plants, they are a thermal power station in which the heat source is a nuclear reactor and then it's transformed into electricity. I think I already mentioned that previously. So a bit of statistics here on renewable energy sources. So the leader of, uh, of uh, renewable energy sources are the soon to be NATO members, Sweden and and uh, Finland, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, Sweden is a bit lower, but uh, but Latvia is in the red. Uh, it marks in red. Oh, and we see that we are quite uh, good at using our renewable energy sources. Uh, Estonia and Lithuania are quite high up as well, our neighbors. Uh, but as we remember, uh, <clears throat> Uh, they received a lot of electricity from the Visagina power plant uh, in Lithuania. And on the table next to the first one, uh, how the EU 27 countries uh, get their electricity. So in the EU, we see that uh, the nuclear energy sector is quite large even now. Then we have gas, wind, hydropower, then we have lignite, coal, uh, I've added uh, them in black. So these are the classic uh, three of uh, fossil fuels. Then we have bioenergy, solar energy. And solar energy is quite low on this ranking, although Germany is putting high hopes on solar energy and wind as well. And lastly, we have other fossil sources at the bottom. Next, which are the countries with the largest uh, nuclear power generation? Uh, <clears throat> um, so these are the countries that uh, <clears throat> uh, get the most of their nuclear power uh, gener generated from uh, power plants. So of course, number one is the USA. Then we have France, so you can see that there are leaders in Europe. Then we have China, Japan, Russia, South Korea, and even Ukraine. Although the number seems quite low because uh, Ukraine uh, has uh, large nuclear uh, power plants, uh, for example, in Zaporizhia. And then we have Great Britain and Sweden. And on the largest reactors in the world, the largest one is, as it turns out, so it's a boiling water uh, reactor. It's, uh, it produces uh, a power of uh, almost 8,000 megawatts. So it's Kasiwazaki Kariwa. Then we have the Canadian Bruce plant. Then we have South Korea's Hanul. And lastly, the largest one in Europe is the one I already mentioned. It's Zaporizhia. So this uh, game from the Russian side was um, quite unpleasant. So in case they actually did something to Zaporizhia, it's close to the Russian border. So that would be borderline uh, suicide for Russians themselves if they actually damaged the plant. 
So I guess uh, common sense sometimes does uh, gain the upper hand uh, in Russia. So uh, the principle about uh, fusion, nuclear fusion, fusion, which is, of course, an affair for the future. Uh, as I uh, answered, uh, the moderator mentioned already that he talked about uh, his children maybe experiencing this in the future. Uh, of course, there were expectations that it, it might happen around 2050. Uh, but now, moving the ITER in France, in Kadarash, uh, not far from Marseille, so uh, now we see that uh, we still have a far way ahead of us. Uh, but one thing should be said that uh, nuclear synthesis uh, and its opportunities uh, of generating power is uh, so fusion is much has a much higher capacity of producing power than uh, fission. Of course, uh, uh, there are some calculations still to be made, but then again, I must remind you that the sun works on the same principle, and the sun is quite smart. So, of course, we can see the track record that we have uh, some good achievements. For example, in uh, in uh, the UK, we saw that there was uh, uh, attempted uh, fusion, which was actually held for quite a long time. Uh, so, uh, there were some issues with overheating, but uh, for the uh, ITERA plant, there will be semiconductors and uh, superconductors, superconductor magnets with uh, coils. So uh, it's no surprise that actually China has already uh, attempted this and has held the energy uh, level for 17 minutes. I didn't know the whole yield they got, but uh, that's it. So, of course, in Latvia, we work with uh, with fusion as well, uh, me included. Of course, uh, lastly, I would like to touch upon low power modular nuclear reactors. Uh, I won't go into details because I will have colleagues who will uh, talk about that. Uh, the small uh, low power reactor is actually something that's used, uh, has been used for a long time, for example, in in submarines, as the defense minister already said. But of course, uh, I'm reaching my conclusion. Of course, it's a scientific uh, problem, of course, the, both the energy crisis and the climate change. So these are crises that science has to deal with. So the role of nuclear reactors is growing and we are awaiting great results from nuclear fusion in the future. So uh, what's important is that nuclear reactors uh, can uh, work anywhere, in any weather, in any geographical locations, and they uh, can work nonstop, and it is not linked to any way, any disruptions. For example, that might be the case for solar and wind energy. Of course, uh, scientific uh, research and scientific experience uh, must grow both in Latvia and Estonia. Uh, even with starting with small reactors. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, dear speaker. Um, I already have several questions, and I saw that several participants have asked their questions in chat section of Zoom. Those of you who have managed to join this, this conference timely can also use the opportunity to ask questions in the chat section. So the first uh, question, or rather uh, a suggestion, okay, fusion of, uh, well, fusion and fusion reactors, so will uh, take some time to be deployed. But uh, we somehow have been led to believe that uh, 
we will be able to cover all our energy consumption only with green energy without using fossil fuels. Would it be possible or is it just a misleading argument? Well, this is also a political and economic problem or issue. Uh, Russia will definitely stand up for maintaining uh, the use of fossil fuels. Also, U.S. Sa says that it has enough of uh, fossil fuel reserves for at least a century. This is quite a complicated problem and it has to be reviewed in contest. European green uh, agenda is both working in our benefit and at the same time causing us disadvantages. It is not only about energy consumption and energy security. We also need to think about health, environment, and energy security. Well, in China, you, you told about seven, uh, 17 minutes as a record breaking, as, a, as breaking the record for uh, keeping the energy. Is it possible to collect this energy? At the moment, we don't have similar or equivalent uh, technology in Europe or US. But if we if we manage to build a reactor to that could be able to generate such an amount of uh, energy that we that it not only co covers our consumption needs but um, also the surplus of energy generation. Would it be possible to collect this energy? What is needed for that? Also, it's, is it a, po a political decision that uh, agreement? It is about agreement among uh, countries. Well, uh, low power modular re reactors won't be able to generate such an amount of uh, uh, energy that it has to. That we need to think about collection. Uh, um, Low power modular reactors can uh, produce such an amount of energy to meet uh, all of our uh, energy consumption demands, or at least part of that. It is not about accumulation. In China, rather, this experiment was used to push the boundaries and to demonstrate to what a reactor is capable of. There are also prototypes of other similar reactors being built, but at the moment we cannot uh, talk about surplus of energy production. There is a trend to move toward low, mo low power mo modular reactors. These uh, reactors won't be, won't be able to generate uh, like a surplus of energy balance. Uh, ITER moderate, uh, sorry, uh, reactor in France will only have around 800 um, mega, megawatts. Well, at least this is what is intended or ex expected for the demo version of ITER reactor. But this is this only applies to the demo version of the ITER reactor, and what knows what is expected, what is to, to be expected in the future. Well, thank you very much for the presentation. I also see that somebody have written their opinion in the chat section, and discussions always form a basis for scientific uh, inventions and discoveries. But now I would like to give the floor to the next speaker, who is Kaleb Kalamet, who. Uh, co-founder and CEO of, of Fermi Energy. For Latvians, and I heard it's the same for Estonians, sometimes when you say that, well, there is, a, you know, one step ahead in Estonia introduced or at least decided, then Latvians go even more faster. So tell me, this might be a nice reason. Oh, you saw now microphones. Nair. It is a microphone. Uh, so, no, 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 we were talking about the microphone, if you have it. So my question is, how far you made a steps one single country, because we always had this feeling that on the terms of energy, and especially nuclear energy, we might do a common decision. So if you are here with a proposal to form a kind of Baltic initiative, 
and I think we should consider Finland as well in, in the same family, and me, maybe even Poland, or do you think each and other country should do it on their own political decisions? And of course, the most interesting part is how this uh, micro generation uh, of a nuclear works. So please. Laba, Diana. Laba. Hello, friends uh, from Latvia. Uh, I'm from uh, Ferminerga and I'm gonna explain uh, what we do in Estonia and then you are able to make your own decisions. Uh, first off, 103 years ago in June, Estonians and uh, Latvians together we won a battle of chases against the Germans to free our countries and avenge for occupation for many centuries. And then we together fought the Russians. So there are not too many who have done that, uh, fought against the Germans and the Russians at the same time and won. So we have had good experience of cooperation. And uh, today we have to decarbonize and we have to get energy independence seriously. And there is room for cooperation as well. A little bit about Ferminerga. It was, was unfortunate that our Lithuanian friends did not manage their nuclear deployment project very well and it was not successful for internal political reasons. But the positive thing that Estonians took from that was that um, several young people were sent to study in uh, Stockholm and they finished with PhDs. And with those people, we decided in 2018 uh, to form a new company, Ferminerga, because we saw that these small modular reactors, they were seriously in licensing and uh, they were seriously in development in Canada and United States. And we knew that the decarbonization has to happen. We knew that there has to be dispatchable power in the Baltic states. And we knew that the old fossil plants, they will not be around forever. And, uh, but we did not know that the CO2 price will be 85. We did not know that uh, Russia will start a war against Ukraine and Europe will decide to not terminate the energy dependence from Russia. Uh, we, since then, 2019, when we found it, we have um, built our team through continuous work and we have concluded several, several studies, a uh, to total of uh, 60 studies. We have 1,300 shareholders, mostly Estonians, but also Vattenfall from Sweden. And we have a good partnerships with uh, Fortum, Chihitachi, Rolls-Royce. I'm going to explain what we have done and what is the logic uh, behind SMR deployment uh, development in, uh, in Estonia. So in the Baltic states, we are in a significant dispatchable power deficit uh, in, uh, in winter season especially. This is hourly basis uh, last year uh, from 1st January to 1st June, uh, showing the deficit, especially in the heating season. It is consistently 2000 uh, megawatts, with we, which we are covering now with imports and uh, fossil fuels. And this situation will get worse as a lot of dispatchable power capacity in North Europe will be closed. And we see the effects of that already. So this was uh, last week. Today, the prices are almost the same. They are close to 200 euros for Estonian, Latvian and Lithuanian power consumers. And now the new situation is that Russia has stopped power exports to Finland because they are not very happy that the Finns have decided finally to join NATO. And unfortunately, a lot of uh, coal capacity will be closed in the North Europe. This will mean, uh, objectively, that uh, the prices will be more expensive. And we look at the power generation in Germany in October. Wind is not blowing every day. Sun is not shining in the autumn. This, is, this cannot be changed with any hope or planning or whatever. The wind just doesn't blow and you have a problem. 
So dispatchable capacity is absolutely needed. Our aim is to achieve a stable priced power output with long-term power purchasing agreements to industrial customers in Estonia, but also in Latvia and Lithuania. Because we know that industries, but also public institutions, yeah, like universities, uh, like ministries, like defense, they need stable power prices to plan their budget, to plan their investments, because the, all the production units, they consume electricity. So large nuclear really is large. Olkiluoto will be finished in Finland, but small modular is smaller than large nuclear and makes a huge difference in construction time, in construction risk. Uh, service life is the same, but the cost of electricity is likely lower because the construction time is lower and the interest during construction is lower. The building volume is smaller, the complexity is smaller. And we have smaller power grid systems, so small makes uh, is suitable for Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania, large actually is not. So we have looked at uh, many, many designs, and this is the reference design, uh, Biverex 300 by Chihitachi, and uh, th that uh, is, has been cho chosen for deployment with Canadian largest utility, Ontario Power Generation, License application will be submitted September of this year. Also, large uh, American utility, Tennessee Valley Authority, has chosen this technology. Also, Poland, Synthos Green Energy, has chosen this technology for 20-unit deployments. This is the most common reactor technology operational in Finland and Sweden. It is well known by academia, regulators, and the utilities. But also, pro pressurized water system which is operating in Lovisa, but also in ring halls. It is very well known technology. Majority of the world uh, nuclear reactors are pressurized water reactors. So this Rolls-Royce technology that is well funded by the government of uh, United Kingdom, but also private sector is quite credible design. So these are the two designs between which we are gonna choose next year. In Estonia, indeed, there have been uh, official decision made last year, the government for nuclear energy working group, which will submit by September of this year intermediate report. And the government mandated in April of this year that the final report of this working group would be submitted by end of next year. After this, uh, the Estonian parliament can make a knowledgeable commitment on nuclear energy program, based on which the nuclear energy law can be adopted and the nuclear energy regulator can be formulated out of uh, radiation uh, defense uh, department of environmental board and technical safety regulator which regulates existing power generation fossil power generation in Estonia and at the same time to have a speedy deployment uh, we need to perform also the planning procedure essentially citing environmental impact assessment so to conclude that by 2027, that we could submit the application for the construction license. We ourselves, the Fermi Energia, we have to do a lot of work to develop a lot of capabilities. Uh, and in 2025, we understand we need to uh, form the consortium agreement, secure the land to prepare really the construction license application, which is very substantial technical document which includes obviously also the safety assessment review in 21 chapters. And we have listed all those chapters. We know who's going to be responsible for each chapter in organization, and we ha will hire additional staff for, for uh, executing those challenges. And then we are able to go through the licensing based or on UK or Canadian license um, and to start hopefully construction 2028, to have reliably power generation after startup procedures and receiving the operator uh, license uh, by 2031. Because we need power, reliable power supply as quickly as possible. This year we had a normal winter. Next year we might have a colder winter. 
And if we have a colder winter, the prices will be even higher than 400, 500, 600 euros per day. Uh, so we need energy uh, for transportation, heating, lightning for our industries. And so energy is the heart of our economies, is the heart of modern societies. Uh, to, you know, to make knowledgeable decisions, you need knowledge. Knowledge you can gain by studying and, uh, and you get confirmed when you have concluded your studies with a degree, be it a bachelor, master's or PhD, or you conclude by commercial serious studies based on which you can make decisions. So we recently have concluded seven different studies and we are very happy to cooperate with Latvenergo, with whom we have an outstanding MOU from uh, October of last year uh, and a good study on the market impact of SMR deployment on Baltic power market. We're really pleased on the professionalism of uh, Latvenergo team and uh, also the results that uh, they demonstrate. We performed also financial strategy uh, for 600 megawatt SMR deployment uh, with Vattenfall AB, and they also showed uh, solid results when we are uh, securing significant part of the power uh, generation with uh, long-term uh, power purchasing agreements. And so we have studied macroeconomic impact for Estonia. We have studied supply chain uh, from Estonian companies that are producing already uh, components for power engineering. Uh, we have ABB, for example, in Estonia, Prismian that produces ca cables. We have Ario Elector, Estonia capital company that uh, has um, meat and low voltage uh, equipment uh, distribution systems. And we have studied, of, of course, the safety of these different designs. We're gonna st uh, study the safety of Rolls-Royce design later this year. And we have in-depth studied the deployment program, done risk analysis with the professionals from Finland. So always the question is, what is the public going to say? So here is in Estonian language, uh, we have uh, evidence that we have measured every six months the public support uh, for consideration of small modular reactor to ensure security of supply in Estonia. And when we started, the support level already then was uh, more than 50%. And we were quite surprised by that result. But now in January 2022, the support level has reached 68%. And we have to rem remember that when Estonia joined uh, European Union 2004, then we had a referenda and then the public support, public support for EU was 66%. So having some support level close to that is almost as high as it is possible in democratic societies. And we definitely want to keep and need to keep democratic societies which, where it's diverse opinions. And nuclear obviously has, brings up diverse opinions. Like it is the same case with taxation, like it is the case with um, vaccines or masks or with any other issue in the society. There are always different kind of opinions, but everybody needs power. So uh, even though we will never, never ever have the support level of North Korea or even Russia uh, supporting the supreme leader of the nation or something like that, um, the support level of two thirds of the society is really sufficient to proceed with decision making for politicians. And we are very pleased that in Estonia, different parties recognized the need for dispatchable power generation, also recognized the need for decarbonization. Because let's face it, the, the fossil energies that we have been using for hundred years and we have burning millions of tons of oil shale every year, this has consequences. Right now we have a massive heat wave 
for hundreds of millions of people in Pakistan and India. Hundreds of millions of people are experiences, experiences experiencing for weeks 50 degrees Celsius. And that is the reason why India has banned export of wheat. The wheat prices have gone very much up due to the war, but also due to the climate change. So the climate change will mean higher prices, disruption in the food supply, disruption in the precipitation patterns. It will probably very likely mean forest fires in Latvia, Estonia, Poland, in Russia, we see massive forest fires already this spring. So we cannot neglect our responsibility, our job that we have to do with decarbonization. We cannot deny the responsibility that uh, we have to stop burning diesel fuel, gasoline fuel in transportation. We have to switch to electrical vehicles. We have to stop burning natural gas in our cities for district heating. We have to decarbonize it. And nuclear can be excellent solution also for district heat. In Tallinn, I know because of the biomass, and gas prices, the district heat prices are more than 70 euros per megawatt hour. If we are able to generate power, electricity, at 55 euros per megawatt hour, because thermal efficiency of steam turbine translated back, it means that the heat output cost is somewhere, somewhere around 20 euros. So 20 is definitely less than 70 euros. Um, and this matters also for district heat consumers in Riga. And many thousands of people are paying more because we are using fossil fuels. And in long term, fossil fuels will be more expensive. The CO2 price will be even more expensive than it is today. So yes, nuclear will definitely be part of the solution for the Nordic countries, like it has been in Sweden, Finland, Canada, UK, we too are Nordic nations and we need to seriously study, learn and most likely deploy that technology in a manner that is suitable to 21st century. And it is a great opportunity uh, for Estonia and I think it's a great opportunity for cooperation between Estonia and Latvia and great opportunity for Estonia and Latvia to cooperate with our security allies, United States, Canada, and our Nordic partners who are joining now, now NATO. So thank you very much. So thank you very much. Uh, so uh, political will, how important substance it is uh, to get it through. Because uh, honestly, when you see a measurement of uh, green energy already used in Latvia, and the green energy that kind of covers all the needs in Estonia, you should work harder. So it might make, let's say, better understanding of politicians to do these super supports uh, for Estonians than we would uh, expect it uh, from Latvia. Don't you have this feeling? I'm a journalist. I'm kind of trying to push uh, sometimes. Because of the green substance in the... In the uh, statistics of Latvia is much greener than in Estonia. So you have uh, yes, better support in your country. It's very difficult to make Taugava bigger. No, yeah, well, <laughs> we can try. <laughs> to get more water into Taugava. So yeah. expanding that is, is uh, so what you need to uh, do in Latvia, you need to not use diesel fuel anymore, yeah. not burn natural gas anymore. Uh, so this has to happen. And how to do the, make it happen? You have to have much more electricity. Mm. And how do you generate that electricity? Yes, you can do wind, but wind doesn't blow all the time. Yes, you can have solar, but sun doesn't shone, shine, shine most of the year. So that, that is the challenge that we have. Of course, and, and the challenges you just mentioned, actually to put these in proportions, the solid nuclear and all the rest of the greens, will be probably uh, answered by our next speaker, uh, Maris. Uh, Maris um, is uh, the... Uh, so, sorry, I switched to Latvian now. <laughs> Maris yes. Balovan okay. said Thank you. Here, uh, all this. Thank you very Thanks, much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Maris uh, Balua, this is the Research and Development Director of at Latvenergo and uh, Master of Economics. 
and uh, he will be talking on the behalf of a company that uh, we hope will uh, make solid decisions and make solid studies. So uh, <clears throat> this uh, nuclear generation principle uh, will be crucial for uh, Latvenergo. And regarding the investment Latvenergo has made, uh, I've heard that uh, you've invested a lot in the Baltic markets in the so-called uh, solar parks. So, uh, Mari, I'll give you the floor. Uh, hello, thank you for giving me the floor. Of course, we uh, invest in uh, many fields, for example, making the, the existing plants more effective and uh, in the development of uh, wind and solar farms as well. For the near future, we must think about how we could integrate other way, ways of uh, manufacturing in our generation portfolio. And to understand that, we must understand why do we need it. In this graph on the right side, you can see where Latvia is uh, located in these two axes. For the first axis is uh, electricity consumption per capita, and the other one is GDP. And here we can see that there is a, a synergy between these two. So the higher the GDP, the higher uh, consumption of electricity per capita. And even if we're in this mid-low level with uh, electricity consumption, we have lower consumption than the European average. If in the future uh, we want to receive, uh, we want to gain our uh, closest neighbors levels, for example, Finland, Norway, or even Canada, in 20 to 30 years, we would have to uh, work quite hard in the field of generation to ensure uh, adequate generation. And the growth of a country is not only characterized by, uh, by generation of electricity, but consumption of electricity in industry, which gives added value. Um, modern society not always um, understands the different uh, <clears throat> means of producing electricity. Uh, you can uh, gain electricity by uh, changing energy. You cannot make energy, right? There are different types and it's quite uh, important to know how to do it in the most rational way. So here you have to take, take into account the available uh, resources for the country infrastructure and uh, the environment, which is the most important. Uh, in Latvia, uh, hydropower will be very <clears throat> important in Latvia and uh, natural gas, unfortunately, will be still important until we find a replacement for that. Of course, there are still, uh, there's still diversification of natural gas uh, delivery systems going on and of course green hydrogen as well so like i mentioned environmental uh, characteristics are quite important like we said uh, with the example with uh, ukraine there was a 100 megawatt uh, solar park created and it was good because the environmental con uh, considerations were there it was the largest uh, park in the world globally we know that for more than uh, 50 years, uh, <clears throat> pipelines uh, have been developed. So those are huge invest investments for many, many years. In order to move, push forward a huge project, you need decades. The biggest projects uh, were carried out in the 60s, for example, Druzhba oil pipeline and uh, the colonial pipeline in the US. And of course, the development has been ongoing and industry is huge. And of course, we understand that if we want to change something in the supply chain in the short term, it is very uh, complicated and problematic. And we can see that uh, in the situation nowadays, uh, in making uh, fast decisions and actions. 
And of course, we think of different resources to move to a nuclear uh, power. We made this comparison. Each country finds it quite uh, important to have uh, strategic reserves uh, to ensure safety of energy. So we can see the U.S. strategic uh, uh, reserves of uh, oil, which is 649 million barrels of oils, which is around one petawatt uh, hours of energy. So if we make a comparison, if we compare it to uranium, it would be 1,700 uh, Westinghouse. So you need a lot, lots of resources uh, to store oil in your country, reservoirs, and you need a lot of uh, uh, safety precautions in this case. So, but if we uh, change uh, uh, change it to the Westinghouse cassettes, uh, you can fit all of them uh, in just one train. For uranium, the highest producers are Kazakhstan, Australia, Namibia, and Canada. So these are not high-risk countries, so there's an opportunity of diversification in, uh, in supply. And that gives an opportunity um, uh, so if we need a different supplier of uh, electricity, for example, for uh, production of fuel, uh, there are options. Ukraine is another <coughs> option, for, so they use Westinghouse cassettes. Uh, and uh, they were supplied by Russia. So if you make uh, the according certification, you can definitely use them. So in the 50 years of the... Apologies. If we uh, make a comparison uh, with uh, Latvia, seven terawatt hours per year, you would only need 35 such uh, uranium Westinghouse cassettes. On a regional level, in the Baltics, we know some plans for each country, uh, how they will develop and up until 2030. You can see all three countries, Estonia included. There is no uh, nuclear here because it's 2030. And we can see that export is maintained at the same level, it's quite significant, 23% uh, as median in Latvia. And then we see generation, it is quite volatile, and there should definitely be steps taken for uh, storage of electricity. And or you should make it stable and be able to dispatch it, able to be dispatched. So the Baltic region, uh, after desynchronization with Brel, so Belarus, Russia, we've connected to some lines uh, in Europe with Poland. This would be the only region in the world with uh, so many uh, direct current connections with synergy. Of, uh, of renewable resources makes the managing of the system quite complex. So uh, this is one of the reasons why there are risks of uh, safety on, in, on different planes. So uh, different actions are being taken. Uh, for example, uh, synchronous compensators will be uh, added. So these are rotating reserves, which uh, ensure the stability of the system. And the same could be done by generators, for example, uh, nuclear reactors, which would ensure the stability of the system in the future. And uh, talking, uh, making a further description, uh, we can see a graph on the left side for DC with inventors, you uh, inverters, you uh, get a sine wave, which is necessary for um, 
for the grid. So here we have another graph for the potential future uh, system. If we had only low power uh, reactors. And lastly, we have sun, solar and wind energy. So with the automatic, automatic control of uh, DC, which has, of course, an influence on, on the safety, uh, which again makes the situation a bit more complicated. So everything, the uh, generation should be and dispatchable and easily manageable. We have a little table on the right side. We have uh, uh, gas, coal, hydro, co uh, nuclear energy. So we have uh, information on their coefficient of of uh, power and uh, nuclear of course would have the highest coefficient of uh, the use of power of course there are costs involved rather high costs so No significant changes are used during the lifetime of a uh, nuclear uh, reaction. Of course, it is a uh, non-carbon uh, technology, so it's dispatchable as well. So the transmission system operator has uh, indicated the adequacy of power up until 2030. And this is a study uh, regarding uh, the three operators of the Baltic states. And they concluded that in 2030, the adequacy of power could be uh, 45 to 105%. So there might be periods where there is not sufficient power. And then we would have to depend on de deliveries from other neighboring countries. And what else is important is uh, that uh, in uh, the demand for 2030, uh, wind uh, uh, power is only 48 to 84 megawatts hours. So that shows how much we can depend on wind power in uh, peak uh, energy uh, energy demand. In our modern society, a lot of uh, a large part of society, in a large part of society, uh, uh, exact sciences are becoming less and less popular and interesting. And our choice in different uh, surveys are are not linked to to well-known facts and uh, uh, and education is based, it's, it's not really based in facts. So here we have an example on the Latvian society on the chosen, um, chosen uh, means of production of energy, which would be the most uh, supported. Uh, the number one and two are solar and wind. Of course, each individual should understand uh, the facts about um, dispatchability and uh, stocking of the energy. Uh, a lot of people do not take that into account. So that's why such answers and results should be taken with a grain of salt and interpreted. Of course, there uh, is uh, news that uh, we need to work with society, uh, individuals, in, in hand in hand with uh, the academic sector and developing the knowledge in our society. And in order to move uh, to sustainable energy in the future, we must understand that the most correct uh, solution would be a balanced energy portfolio. 
And here we have an example from a reactor in Sweden, a station in Sweden, where there is nuclear uh, power <laughs> included as well. So the green uh, splash is not an explosion. It's just the uh, green energy. Um, but the red, uh, uh, red, uh, red sector is the nuclear energy. As we can clearly see how stable and how it, the energy production is and how it changes over time. So we can see that uh, it's, it's quite easy to ensure uh, the necessary amount of power, ad an adequate amount of power when it is necessary. Uh, what else is important is emissions and nuclear has the lowest uh, amount of emissions together with hydro and wind. Of course, I should add here that uh, biomass stations say that they have little emissions because, uh, uh, for example, wood would uh, create these emissions just uh, decomposing somewhere else. But in reality, when uh, uh, wood uh, would uh, is used uh, in this process uh, are quite quite higher than even uh, natural gas stations and if we talk about biomass we talk about uh, uh, heat supply and not electricity production uh, if and then we should take into account uh, how how well uh, well, the process works. Um, thank you very much. That is all from me. I would like you to keep in mind how for sustainable development. Thank you very much, Maris. Uh, uh, the next speaker will be Olex. He is a colleague of yours in the energy field, and uh, he will he will try to answer the question is cogeneration something like uh, a new wonder of the world, or is it like a regular part of uh, our energy generation system. Microgeneration or cogeneration sounds like something new nowadays, but it is an in innovative solution that uh, we should definitely embrace and we shouldn't be afraid of that. As far as I know, there are also students of Mr. Limkovich uh, among the participants, but today he will mainly speak not only to the students, but also to potential investors and other stakeholders. Um, thank you very much for the introduction, Mr. Bogustos. Nuclear security is uh, not a joke, it's not a fun deal. I'm also a professor of the Riga Technical University, as you know, and my scientific interests are related to technologies for electricity generation, including uh, nuclear technologies and nuclear power plants. But my uh, educational background is not related to nuclear sciences. However, thanks to my teacher, engineering doctor Valdis Gavars, who used to be the main engineer in Salaspil's nuclear power plant, I also gained invaluable knowledge and uh, I can transfer this knowledge to my students. I give them insights in, um, well, nuclear, nuclear uh, power generation basics. I was also I have also been involved in uh, the project of Visagina nuclear power plant. It was I was involved in this project until our Lithuanian neighbors decided, however, to give up on the project of uh, constructing Visagina nuclear power plant. So I am really happy and pleased to hear that Fermi Energy is, however, bringing further the nuclear agenda in the Baltic states. And I hope to get more involved in this project. Today, I'm going to talk about low power modular nuclear reactor technologies. Um, 
unlike the uh, before mentioned Visagina nuclear power plant, uh, I believe that low power modular nuclear nuclear reactors are more suitable for microgrids as present in such countries as Latvia and Estonia and Lithuania. Uh, it is to note that uh, Finland is uh, currently developing uh, a large scale nuclear power plant. It, uh, the project in Finland was started in 2005, and uh, at first it was expected to complete the project within five years, but the project, in fact, will be completed only now or in the upcoming years and the budget was increased was was exceeded by around 10 billion compared to what was expected originally so why i'm um, such an advocate for small scale modular reactors why do i believe that smrs or small modular reactors are our so our potential solution for uh, energy security. Um, small modular nuclear reactors are nowadays defined as nuclear reactors with power between 10 to 300 megawatts. They are characterized by higher degree of modularization, standardization and industrial constructions to maximize the intensity of serial production or so-called series effect the series effect is actually the reason behind the cost effectiveness of smrs due to the modular approach mass production simplified construction standardization and harmonized licensing process it is possible to achieve the so-called series effect to compensate for the disadvantages caused by the smr scale effect for instance poland could uh, uh, benefit from 25 smrs or finland or sorry estonia could uh, deploy two smrs and uh, as a result uh, it, it is possible to use mass production or series for the serial production and achieve cost effectiveness and the so-called series effect so what are the advantages of smrs it is a good solution for small scale power systems uh, in such countries like baltics with uh, relatively low power consumption and relatively low demand we also don't have market players or investors that could invest billions in our energy market so main advantages include modular or standard and standardized approach simplified design serial production cost savings easier licensing and certification procedures uh, also construction is shorter it won't take like 15 years as it was in case of finland it's uh, it could uh, take from five to seven years or so uh, SMRs are easier to be transported in parts to the construction site. Uh, such technologies as used in the SMRs usually are equipped with passive safeguards and safety features and no electricity are needed to operate them. For instance, if uh, an, an SMR is erected somewhere near the residential areas, it is of utmost importance to consider all the safety and security aspects. The passive safeguards and security features uh, involved in the, in the latest generation SMRs uh, are to ensure that uh, everything will be safe and sound. SMRs uh, include actually a group of, of technologies. It is not just one technology, but several types of uh, technologies and approaches. They are based on as the so-called conventional large-scale nuclear technologies. Uh, for instance, light water nuclear power plants, for instance, boiling water power plants or high water water pressure power or pressurized water power plants 
Um, it is possible to erect or construct uh, SMRs as a monoblock uh, solution or as a, mo a multi-modular SMR, which consists of several smaller modules. Um, another option is uh, to have uh, SMR that at the same time can generate hydrogen. This is uh, probably a, a future technology. Among the types of uh, SMRs and technologies used in some, uh, I have to mention also generation four SMRs, they use innovative nuclear reactor technologies, including those present in fast neutron reactors. They include many concepts that have been studied by the Generation 4 International Forum. And another type is micromodular reactors with power below 10 megawatts. Without going into further detail, I would simply like to, well, name a couple of um, SMRs. Uh, BWRX 300 Hitachi. It was also mentioned by Kalev in his presentation. It uh, includes boiling water technology, UK SMR, is Rolls Royce with pressurized water technology. Um, let's have a look at the GE Hitachi BWRX 300 uh, technology. The original power was of the prototype was around 1,000 megawatts, but uh, the uh, well, the power was reduced to 300 megawatts. This uh, reactor uses boiling water technology with only one uh, water with only one circuit. There is no recirculation pump. Such a simple or simplified technology helps to ensure that even in case of emergency, it is possible to it's possible to provide for passive cooling. So passive cooling is ensured without any intervention from the operator. Estonia intends to construct two or even four such a, such type of reactors in its nuclear project. An interesting new approach is French Nord project or French Nord project, uh, or sorry, reactor. This is... Uh, um, a reactor of very interesting uh, construction. The pressure vessel with a band is contained in a seal protective housing and submerged in water to ensure passive cooling. The pressure vessel itself is integrated both with the nuclear fuel, that is the active region and submerged control rods. What is interesting is that it also includes pressure control mechanisms, circulatory pumps, and uh, compact steam generators. All of it uh, integrated in one in one housing of the pressure vessel. This is quite an interesting uh, reactor for construction-wise, but it's quite complicated also as we talk about the disadvantages. Uh, let us talk about generation four reactors and uh, uh, their design. On December 20, 21st last year, world's first generation four nuclear power plant was connected to the grid. Uh, it is in China, HTRPM reactor. Um, it includes high temperature gas cooled, gas cooled nuclear reactors with graphite coated spherical uranium elements. It uses helium gas. This is HTR type reactor. Active cooling is ensured by helium. And it, the, the whole system consists of two reactors and both of them operate one turbine. Since high temperatures are reached, 
this reactor is also capable of uh, producing industrial heat and probably also can could be used for hydrogen production. So, th so here is another example. This is rather well to to have fun of it. There are the so-called floating nuclear nuclear power plants present in China and also in Russia. Russia has uh, constructed uh, a floating nuclear nuclear power plant. Uh, in form of a ship, and but as we, as far as as we know, notoriously, there's a great saying about Russians and their warships and where they should be headed. Um, as to Latvia, in 2010, uh, um, an interesting study was conducted uh, regarding a potential construction of a nuclear power plant in Latvia. The study reviewed, uh, you know, well, feasibility of constructs of. Con constructing uh, high power generation three uh, nuclear reactors and low power reactors from generation four in Latvia. The construction site, uh, uh, as it was uh, as it was established, had to be located by a large source of water supply. So therefore, three feasible locations were reviewed by the Baltic Sea and by two larger lakes. And as part of as a part of the study, several conclusions were made. So first of all, public consent is needed to start a nuclear program on the national scale. A Latvian public is less positive regarding a nuclear agenda in Latvia than it is compared to Lithuania and Estonia. Nuclear program could be successfully initiated. Uh, only if a special law is passed by the cabinet of ministers. So I know that Estonia has already started drafting its nuclear law. In Latvia, we don't have any such legal, legal enactments. Well, um, an important step, or I'd say even the first step, is to choose the right location for building a nuclear power plant. Usually it takes uh, up to three to four years. An independent national nuclear safety inspectorate would be required with at least uh, 20 experts. I know that uh, Lithuania has established uh, a nuclear safety inspectorate and regulatory authority. And Estonia is also on the way of uh, establishing uh, such an inspectorate. A specific national scheme for high-level radioactive waste management is necessary. It is uh, of utmost importance. So before starting uh, any further steps, it's necessary to consider what we do with nuclear waste when it's generated. Previous speakers talked about European Green Agenda. It uh, emphasizes development of solar and wind energy in uh, Europe. The solar and wind energy is expected to cover um, power capacity and uh, baseload. However, we have to take into account that wind and solar capacity, wind and solar energy capacity is not sufficient and it is unstable. On the one hand, we need to think about ways of, of compensating the lack of capacity in consumption, the lack of capacity and cover the excessive uh, consumption needs, so everything that cannot be covered by wind and solar energy. But on the other hand, if we have a mix of wind, solar and nuclear energies, sometimes uh, nuclear energy capacity could be reduced in order to, to use wind and solar energy sufficiently and to gain full benefit of it. Uh, a world nuclear, uh, sorry, uh, OECD has performed a study and projected nuclear LCOE co costs for plants built in 2020 to 2025. So 
the calculations you can see on the slide are quite similar to those that we have calculated with 300 discount rate and 100 discount rate. The prices indicated here are actually quite uh, good or reasonably good. It has to be noted that nuclear power plants, uh, unlike uh, wind or solar plants, take more time to be constructed. So wind or solar uh, power plants usually, however, are in operation for 20 years, but nuclear power plants uh, could, can be operated for at least 60 years. At the end of my presentation, I would like to touch upon the EU delegated acts and taxonomy. According to these delegated EU acts, uh, new, uh, nuclear energy and natural gas are considered as means to phase out fossil fuels and move towards a, a climate neutral energy. Therefore, it is expected to allow construction of new nuclear power plants and natural gas plants during the transition period, and we still have time to do that. Thank you very much. We'll have numerous questions now. Uh, if Mars Balwads hears us and he wants to get involved, maybe both of you could uh, tell us if today in the real life, do you feel attempts to, I don't know, uh, choice of uh, locations or shortlist of locations? Are there uh, talks of investments do people uh, really believe that Latvenergo will be the ones that can carry it uh, out and uh, who could it be or is is it just or is it on the other hand just uh, uh, talks and uh, dreams of scientists uh, well as the previous speakers mentioned uh, uh, Latvenergo cooperates with Termi Energy and they're looking at territory in Estonia as well Electrum uh, work in uh, Estonia as well. Egonia has a slight advantage uh, in comparison to Latvia. In Estonia, if you have, if you build a re nuclear reactor, you have to uh, dispose of uh, nuclear waste. So, and this uh, uh, level uh, is of of the ground uh, level that has to be dug up for nuclear waste is quite low in Estonia, two to three meters, so that's an advantage. Uh, but referring to the, I referred to a study, there were uh, five uh, propositions of places, uh, <clears throat> and but they were already talked about uh, uh, during the Soviet times. Artur Skruskovs, my, my colleague, uh, I hope he's listening to me now. So in Pavlost uh, on the west side, before Ignolina was built in Lithuania, there was plan of building it in, there in Pavlost in Latvia. And uh, that's why these, I just wanted to say that these have al places have already been studied. So if we compare the work done by uh, Fermi Energia, how many specialists uh, they, they <clears throat> They're recruited for uh, studies, topography and geological studies in, in uh, collaboration with the municipalities. Because in that year in Latvia, there was really no communication with the municipalities with uh, opportunities to build these projects. So Fermi Energy with their two to three municipalities had an on, uh, ongoing dialogue with them and they were involved in the process and uh, people expressed their opinions. Agris uh, is asking a question in the chat. I'm not sure if Agris is a geologist or a, or a physician, physicist, I'm sorry. So he says that uh, nuclear waste should be stored in uh, somewhere in Latvia where there is clay, not rock. So uh, can someone uh, from the Technical University give a mark into Agri's statement? Well, not really. I'm not really an, a geologist, but uh, it's really hard for me to answer this. But as far as I know, in Finland and Sweden and the US, uh, that's, uh, they are actually buried deep beneath the ground. So he's writing that uh, clay is hermetic, but uh, rock is not. So, but here, uh, as it was with uh, 
gas terminals. So if every country uh, will build their own ones. So previously, uh, countries wanted to make uh, shared ones. But of course, that was more expensive back in the day. But how would you say, is it strategic for geopolitically, strategically important for each country to make their own terminals? And uh, uh, how is it in regarding with uh, our experience with uh, and disruptions in supply chains and, uh, and a lot of different factors. So why should we build it with Estonians? Uh, why can't we just, uh, from the sovereign perspective of our country, why shouldn't we build our own ones? From uh, the perspective of our sovereign nation, of course, I would be really happy that we built our own uh, nuclear reactor. I would even be ready to live next to the reactor if someone does, else doesn't feel safe. But of course, first uh, and foremost, we should talk to the people, the society. We, if we compare the view of uh, uh, on nuclear and society in Estonia, we see that the Estonians have done their homework and they are much more positive uh, towards a nuclear. Uh, of course, these MMR technologies allow us to build, uh, for example, two reactors in uh, Estonia, two in Latvia. But of course, we should uh, take a look at the economic uh, perspective. And if we talk about geology, from a geological perspective, Latvia can easily uh, store natural gas in a, the depth of 800 meters, but uh, for nuclear waste, uh, there is a shaft where you have concrete shells, and this uh, used nuclear fuel is uh, is, uh, is supposed to store uh, be stored for a hundred years. Of course, we haven't experienced the hundred years yet. But uh, so uh, continuing your idea that it is safe and that we should use it and it's something that we haven't yet uh, mastered and haven't yet uh, learned to be, to, to just uh, see it as something safe. So now we have the next speaker. Uh, we have Wade uh, Ellison, uh, who's, uh, who has uh, numerous uh, books that he's written already. So today we will read one of his books in a shorter version. Uh, uh. Okay. Well, uh, we already learned the problem is not only choosing the technology of which there are many, but uh, we also have the problem of uh, half a century of telling the world that nuclear is terribly dangerous and they don't want to know about it. Uh, and suddenly we need to persuade them that it's not only safe, but it's extremely important for our, uh, for our future. Now, this isn't the first time in the history of the world that this has happened, uh, because in the last 3,500 year, million years, the, uh, human, uh, the life has uh, learnt a lot about energy. Um, can I have the next slide, please? There we are. This is the last time there was a major confrontation. Uh, and we learnt, we overcame the objections of the Green Party, uh, and we persuaded them to take fire into the home. And that was very dangerous, but it was very important that we did that. Uh, and we took the public with us. This is about 600,000 years ago. Uh, and in those days, the Green Party were right because fire was dangerous, but we still had to do it. And today the Green Party is wrong because in fact, fire is much more dangerous than nuclear energy and radiation. And that is what I want to uh, discuss. Can I have the next slide, please? Energy is governed by two strict scientific laws. Both of them are really very simple. First, you can't make energy. You've got to find it from somewhere. And it's got to go somewhere as well. 
So uh, we call all sources of energy fuel, and what we need are the primary sources of energy. Because so once we've got a primary source, then we can make secondary sources like electricity and hydrogen uh, and so on from it. Um, so we're looking for primary sources of, of, uh, of energy or fuels. And the second law says that if energy is left on its own, it will go downhill. So if we see a rock on the top, we say, well, put that up there. And why hasn't it already rolled downhill? This is sort of obvious, but it's called the second law of thermodynamics. Similarly with heat, if you have a cup of hot coffee, it will go cold. If you had two cups of lukewarm coffee, you can't make one cup of hot coffee out of them. You can't do it. So what we're looking for when we look for energy is the hottest coffee, the hottest source of energy, because with them, we can make uh, other sources of energy relatively simply. Can I have the next slide, please? But that then brings us to the problem of safety, because the energy has to be under control. And I'd rather not use the word safety because it's got emo um, emotional. That's, it's a matter of control. We need to control when we use the energy and what we use it for, and to turn it off where we don't want it. So many sources of possible sources of energy either have already dissipated or we have difficulty in controlling them. And here we see two famous uh, examples of fire uh, getting out of control. In one case, after having been stored for over 800 years. So if we look at the universe as a whole, we'll find for all possible sources of energy, there are very, very few that haven't already completely discharged or which we can't control. Now the next slide, please. The universe, we'll zoom in on where we are in a minute, but the universe is huge and empty. And in fact, it spans 41 powers of 10 in size. And if we look out in our own world, uh, we can see our galaxy down to the smallest things we can see under a microscope. That's about 21 powers of 10. Sorry, 26 powers of 10. That's the range in blue. But we can't see the electronic atom, which is 100,000 times smaller, or the, uh, sorry, I don't want the, the, the um, can, we go, can we go back? Um, on, click, that's right, and back again, and back again. Right. So we can't see the smallest, either the smallest atom or the nucleus, which is 100,000 times smaller than the atom. So where is the energy? Well, uh, can I have the click? One click, that's right. We live in with the energy that comes from the sun and it comes down to us as humans on the state on the level of a couple of meters. Uh, and that is the uh, energy source that we have lived in uh, up until the, uh, the, uh, the, the early days of uh, through the through the Middle Ages. Um, and then, but life was pretty miserable under those conditions, uh, and uh, life was very short and uh, uh, and miserable. Uh, can I have the next click, please? So then we discovered fossil fuels, which used the also used the energy from the sun, but preserved geologically 
in the form of atoms and molecules of carbon uh, buried in the earth, uh, deep frozen as it were, uh, and this gave us energy, which was 10,000 times more energy uh, density and uh, is available 24 seven and it provided steam and other engines and it was rejected, but it was rejected in 2015 uh, uh, because of the effect of its emissions. You can have the next slide, the next uh, click please. So then we come to nuclear energy. And the question is, where does that come from? Well, leaving aside fusion for a moment, the energy of the uranium and thorium that we are using in nuclear energy is generated in uh, events like we have seen, we can see today in the universe uh, outside, uh, for instance, as was seen uh, in the crab supernova, which uh, which exploded in 1054, or rather it was seen to explode in 1054 by Korean astronomers. Uh, and although it was 500 million times further away than the sun, this explosion was visible in broad daylight for 23 days to the Korean astronomers. And that's a picture of that exploding explosion as it's seen today, as seen by Hubble. And that generates uh, uh, uranium and thorium, um, uh, or uh, su such explosions uh, before uh, the Earth was formed as responsible for the uranium and thorium in our world today. It has a million times the energy density of the fossil fuels, but it's available 24 seven uh, and it has no emissions. And also non-trivially, uh, it's much more widely spread around the world than, uh, than, uh, um, uh, that, than, than the fossil fuels. So many of the political problems that fossil fuels create uh, will, will, uh, will go away. Can I have the next slide, please? It is difficult to realize, to understand just how small the nucleus is. It's a hundred thousand times smaller than the atom. If you stand on the edge of an atom and you look at a nucleus, you wouldn't be able to see it. Uh, in fact, you'd need a, a telescope with a magnification at least a thousand in order to, to, uh, uh, to see it. So it's incredibly small uh, and, uh, and essentially nuclei do nothing. Only one nucleus in a million has made any change in the last 5,000 million years since the earth was created. Uh, and, uh, that's why this enormously powerful source of energy was not even known about until 1896. Can I have the next slide, please? And it's incredibly safe. And it's incredibly safe because each of those nuclei are surrounded by a, an electric field, which prevents them getting anywhere near one another. So, this is on a log-log scale, and it indicates that uh, not only is the nucleus incredibly small, but uh, you would need a temperature of in excess of 10 million degrees in order to get two nuclei anywhere close to, to one another. So one day we will uh, uh, perhaps have nuclear fusion, but at the moment we're much better off with nuclear fission. Can I have the next slide, please? So there are, so they, in fact, there are only three candidates for uh, sources of energy. The first is what we used in the pre-industrial era, uh, which is wind and solar and hydro, bio, wood, uh, and also uh, the effort that we could get by talking to 
uh, animals and other humans uh, and engaging them in teams and slaves and so on. Uh, this was part of the way uh, in which humans became more powerful than individual uh, animals. But the energy density, uh, and you can calculate this, at, for instance, this, this figure actually comes from the energy density of one kilogram of water by behind a hundred meter high dam is very, very small. Uh, and uh, it's accepted. These are renewables, they're accepted. People will like them, they're not frightened of them, but they're intermittent, weak, uh, and the plant to use them is huge, has to be huge and it's very da damaging to nature. Can I have a clip, please? So then we got to the industrial revolution with fossil fuels, with a much higher, 10,000 times the energy density, then the fuel needed to, for all the energy that people need in a lifetime is like 500 tons of coal each, as opposed to 10 million tons of water behind a hundred meter high dam. It's on a completely different scale, but most important is that coal was available 24 seven. And I said that anywhere, but it was only for those who had access to fossil fuels, not to those who didn't. Uh, but the problem was emissions and not very good safety. Can I have the next slide, please? And so then we get nuclear fission, uh, uranium and thorium, where the energy density is something like 20 million kilowatt hours per kilogram. That assumes that all of the nuclei are, fish, are fission. And then you only need one kilogram of such fuel per person for, uh, to power, give them the energy for a lifetime. It's tw available 24 seven like, uh, and anywhere like, uh, um, you're, uh, like uh, fossil fuels. Uh, and it's much better safety. And we'll go into that more in a minute. What's the problem? The problem is fear and poor education and that people don't know anything about it. And it comes from pre-solar supernovae. This is really the, the, uh, the, um, the uh, comparison that is needed to evaluate the use of uh, nuclear power. Now the next slide, please. Um, so what about safety? Well, everybody's aware that there's a great thing goes on about Chernobyl, but the animals in the evacuation zone at Chernobyl, they don't seem to be aware that there is a problem. Uh, there's radioactivity there, but they're thriving. In fact, they're much better off now than they were when there were when uh, uh, when there were still so many humans around. They must do. Do they know something that we don't? Well, maybe they. You might say they. Maybe they don't know something which we think we know and is actually mistaken. And perhaps nuclear radiation is harmless at low and moderate doses. Can I have the next slide, please? That's a whole an enormous subject on which we could talk from, uh, for ages. But people already know uh, the effects of, uh, or the benefits of nuclear technology because it's been uh, uh, helping with uh, health for 120 years. Uh, and the name of Mary Curie uh, 
uh, is very high on people's um, uh, um, uh, a list. Can I next click, please? Click. Oh, well, something's gone. Can you go back? No, there's meant to be something in between. Anyway, I can tell you. Uh, the problem was everything was fine in Mary Curie's day and medicine was making great progress. But in as a result of the Second World War and, uh, and the Cold War, uh, humanity lost the human, uh, lost their nerve and uh, bogus science and uh, over-regulations, the regulations were tightened by a factor of 700 without any scientific justification. This was all political uh, and people were so frightened of radiation that they demonstrated uh, and uh, um, argued um, and so that the regulations were made absurd and they still are absurd. But this is another subject. Regulation should be based on science, firm science, and this change needs to be made today. These regulations, the situation can be explained in a simple diagram. Next slide, please. In this diagram, the area of each circle represents the uh, radiation it, it, uh, exposed in one month. And the red circle is what the tumor, somebody's tumor gets when they are receiving radiotherapy. Uh, and that is fatal to the tumor and that governs the level of the uh, exposure that is given. So that is, is red for a good reason. The yellow circle is the uh, dose which people experience, or rather the uh, uh, tissue around the tumour uh, gets, uh, and people survive that. Uh, it, may get, it may get, uh, uh, hair may fall out, uh, and uh, have uh, uh, scars and so on, but they survive it occasionally, very occasionally, uh, uh, a few percent chance of getting a cancer there, but it's unlikely. The green circle is the radiation dose which, from which nobody at Fukushima, no, sorry, nobody at Hiroshima and Nagasaki received any uh, known uh, serious result uh, and uh, from all work in the laboratory and so on, is uh, known to be safe. It does not cause cancers or any other uh, serious things, and that is the level of 100 milligray per month or millisievert per month. The small black dot is the level which is currently a thousand times smaller which is supposed to set the level of, of uh, uh, current regulations. Uh, and that has caused a great deal of suffering. It caused the uh, um, evacuation at Fukushima, which was quite unnecessary. Uh, and uh, it causes uh, enormous compensation payments to be made, it uh, upgrades of reactor designs, which were unnecessary, uh, or in, uh, in, uh, uh, justified by uh, paper uh, improvements in safety, uh, which are completely unjustified in stance. Now the next slide, please. So, Let's put things in perspective. This is a graph which shows the, from the, this is from a UK government website showing the total uh, 
monthly uh, offshore wind power output. Uh, this is offshore wind, so this is the, the best form of wind power uh, over a month. Uh, and this, is, this was March this year, uh, it wasn't, it was uh, the, the one that uh, existed in, at, uh, at the time that I looked at, uh, that I looked at it. And you can see that for several weeks, uh, it is pretty close to being at the level of 10 giga gigawatts for, for sometimes up to a week. Can I have the next slide? Then at the level, that's right, then the level at the time between the 21st and the 28th of March, the output of wind power dropped by uh, from 10 gigawatts down to 1.5 gigawatts. Now the physics of wind power is relative possible source of, of uh, maximum uh, energy is uh, relatively simple to calculate. And when the wind drops by a factor of two, the power drops by a factor of eight because it goes by the third power of the wind velocity. So wind only has to drop by a factor of two to go from 10 gigawatts down to 1.5 gigawatts. Now that is a, an amazing amount of energy. That's 8.5 gigawatts of hour of energy not available for a week, 176 hours. That's 1,500 gigawatt hours of energy. That is the same as 1,700 Beirut bombs uh, of the kind that blew up in uh, 2020. And the public have got to realize that when we're talking, when you start integrating, when you start storing energy, uh, there's, it's an enormous amount of energy one's talking about. It's on the scale of, of, uh, of um, so, can I have the next slide, please? Now, this is something I don't hear enough people talking about. There is no, if you have enough nuclear power, you don't need another source of power. But the demand, electricity demand, goes up and down, uh, according, for instance, this is not real data, uh, according to the blue graph, it goes up and down. And if you run the nuclear power to match the peak uh, electrical power needed, then at night and at, uh, when less power is needed, you can make uh, desalinated water, you can make hydrogen, uh, you can, uh, of course, you can always provide um, uh, um, uh, heat, heat, um, uh, heat for industrial processes and so on. But if you have nuclear power, which is matched to the maximum electrical power needed, then uh, you don't need another form of, uh, of power. If you have molten salt reactor, then you can uh, deal with short-term excursions using the uh, thermal capacity of the, uh, of, the, of the salt. Can I have the next slide, please? One of the big problems I think in public perceptions about energy is that the public decides, thinks that what you must have is carbon capture or you must have big batteries. But technology is not that, on, and uh, science is just not that easy. And getting batteries which are big enough to store the amount of energy that was uh, was uh, equivalent to um, the Beirut bomb involves some very, very dangerous 
storage of energy. And the uh, batteries, electrical batteries, um, have particularly lithium batteries, uh, uh, are in a lot of difficulty with their safety uh, requirements. So uh, there have been a lot of safety, a lot of, uh, of battery fires, um, uh, not only here in, in, in Australia, where this is the biggest battery in, in uh, the Southern Hemisphere, but also both halves of the largest battery in California have failed in the last half, uh, last uh, year. And in Liverpool, uh, a nuclear, a, um, a battery blew up, uh, and the same in Beijing, Arizona, South Korea, uh, and that's a big problem. Whereas nuclear, there is only one loss of, only one uh, uh, situation with a loss of life uh, in the last 50 years, and that, of course, was at Chernobyl. So, uh, next slide, please. The question is, what about the waste? Well, what indeed? This is a bogus question that doesn't prevent a lot of people asking it and a lot of people earning a living and getting fat contracts answering it. That first of all, there is very little waste. If you look at the amount of nuclear waste per person per day, assuming that you have a 100% nuclear uh, uh, community, then the personal waste of person is about one kilogram and the amount of nuclear waste is much smaller. Both forms of waste should be recycled, particularly because in the case of nuclear waste, it's only been 1% used. Uh, and uh, so uh, it can be recycled uh, and to it's very much smaller amount of uh, and in the case of personal waste, uh, it can get recycled on the land uh, and it's a good form of fertilizer. Storage, you can store nuclear waste for 600 years after recycling and after that it becomes completely normal. Personal waste is released into the environment. It's certainly not safe. It spreads disease. Uh, and, and is therefore uh, contagious, whereas nuclear waste, nuclear radiation, is not contagious. There are terrible stories from Fukushima and indeed from uh, after Hiroshima and Nagasaki of people being frightened of contagion by uh, nuclear radioactivity. It does not multiply, it does not spread. Uh, public understands nothing about uh, nuclear waste. In the case of personal waste, all children from the age of one or two years are required to uh, know what to do. In fact, we don't let them out into society until they do understand it. And this is how we deal with a serious problem. It should tell us how to do with a much less serious problem, which is nuclear waste. So the world death toll from nuclear waste is essentially per year uh, is none uh, and uh, from personal waste is millions per year. Do have the next slide please, which is my last, I think. So it's all about fear uh, and there's a nice quote here, fear does not prevent death. It prevents life. So what we need to study, uh, and uh, we have to persuade people, uh, but a lot of people get salaries from, uh, from, uh, from uh, looking after uh, fear, some things which 
are not there. Um, I have read, written two general popular books. There's no uh, there's no, no heavy maths in either of these. They're meant for people to understand. It needs to be studied and looked at carefully. Uh, I've uh, added here uh, uh, two references which discuss things in slightly more detail um, and uh, um, including challenging the priesthood of radiation protection. There's a whole business of, of preventing people being affected by radiation when in fact it's not going to affect them anyway. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, we are um, happy now that you shared uh, these links. We will share it uh, also uh, to people uh, later. So they will go and read these books. Uh, and definitely you gave us a great uh, a list of, of arguments we will use. And it is true uh, also in our society. We have to argue, argue, put the arguments ahead and, and, and make this discussion lively, but also based on uh, real facts. So thank you for giving uh, real facts to us as well. Real facts will continue. There will be more... Um, okay, so sorry, uh, switching to Latvian. Well, sorry, I, I'm switching to Latvian, and I was simply carried away by the wonderful presentation by, by Mr. Wade Allison. We will continue with real facts but it will take place after the break and in the next in the second part of the conference so we will not only approach real and serious facts but we will also have a look at a funny video but the next presentation will be dedicated to institutional and political framework as well as legal framework uh, Gunnar Svaldman is a student of uh, doctor, uh, doctorate studies, uh, will give an insight in institutional and energy policy framework for possible introdu introduction of nuclear energy in Latvia. So how far do you think uh, we are from introducing uh, well, a nuclear power plant in Latvia, is, could, a, could a nuclear power plant be opened in Latvia in five or 10 years time? Well, definitely no less than 15 years. And I will tell about the steps, how, how we could approach uh, the nuclear deployment in Latvia. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for inviting me to have uh, a stand in this uh, conference and to give my presentation we can we can be blamed for many things but in uh, the energy sector we always uh, try to think about cooperation with other industries we are really interested and uh, in, in cooperating with other industries and uh, in in different ways uh, to complement our activities so i would like uh, to give my presentation on uh, on main strategic and polit political preconditions for deployment of nuclear energy and this presentation has been developed not only by me but also by our strategic partners including Latvenergo which is a power supply company in Latvia and also representatives from the University of Latvia and other stakeholders we want always to be on the same page and always complement each other in our views and opinions. Um, Latvenergo is, a, is a, a pioneer and a leader in the development of a strate a strategic framework. But when it comes to key strategic preconditions for deployment of uh, nuclear energy in Latvia, I would say that there are three main directions of activities that we have to take. Well, three main groups of preconditions. First of all, it is about uh, legal preconditions. It is necessary to perform a different uh, preliminary. Tas nozara, kurā ir jādefinē skaidrtās status likumdošanā, 
un jāpieņem arī skaidri politiskie lērni. So this is this is a new industry, a new sector, and then so new legal enactments have to be developed. So I will go into details, but at first I will talk about uh, different different restrictions that are applicable to radioactive substances and materials. Such materials are in a way unsafe. Therefore, the uh, accessibility to such materials and substances have to be restricted and only limited to particular scope of people. The next group includes administrative and technical preconditions. A specific administrative capacity is necessary and also re uh, relevant uh, laws and regulations have to be drafted. A specific institutions have to be established and they require um, an expertise dedicated to nuclear safety and compliance as well as monitoring of these aspects. Third category is political preconditions. Well, political su uh, support and agreement is necessary not only among political elite, but also among general public. A broad accessibility of information has to be ensured and uh, there should be a, a public analysis of risks, benefits and costs. Probably a, a, pop, a popular vote or referendum should be organized or other type of uh, public discussion has to be ensured. Let us go into details in uh, legal preconditions. First of all, we need uh, uh, a legislative enactment on constructing a an, an, an nuclear power plant in Latvia. So this law on the nuclear power plant and its construction has to give mandate for constructing a, a nuclear power plant and also to regulate in detail the whole nuclear industry. The next um, legislative precondition is choice of construction site. This is not only a technical, but also a legal issue. We live in a democratic society, therefore we have to take into account not only our views and opinions, but also the views, opinions and interests of our neighbors and other users of the same area. If we want to sacrifice uh, the interests and uh, legal benefits of uh, a particular group of society or inhabitants of a particular area, we need to compensate them for the disadvantages in one way or another. In case of a nuclear power plant construction, most likely we will have to take the route of compensating somebody for the disadvantages caused. But everything has to be stipulated in detail in laws and regulations. The next task is to establish a nuclear safety supervisory body. That would be an institution responsible for, uh, per, for personnel certification uh, licensing of uh, specific aspects related to nuclear power plants. Probably these responsibilities can be delegated to an existing institution or a new, completely new institution could be established. It might sound that it's easy, easy, easy task to do, just simply uh, adopt a, a law or regulation. But in fact, it is a legislative process can be quite lengthy, especially if there are some uh, misunderstandings, some disputes, opinions do not uh, do not conform with with each other, and the whole process can become quite lengthy. When it comes uh, to training and educating uh, a new type of specialists, not only in nuclear energy and nuclear physics, but also in related fields, it also takes quite time. We need new specialists uh, in uh, 
heat energy if we could work in the nuclear power plant we need to train and and to educate uh, lawyers and other specialists uh, to work in a specific supervisory body we need to train and educate also specialists from other supervisory and monitoring bodies and inspectorates at the same time everything should be regulated by particular legislative uh, enactments and the whole procedure should be regulated starting from initiating the operations of the nuclear power plant up to the waste management and the commissioning of the power plant administrative and technical preconditions uh, in many fields overlap they are like an umbrella to cover uh, several fields well administrative uh, preconditions are not so, uh, not so much uh, related to legal aspects but rather was uh, different uh, material needs like ensuring uh, workforce so we need to consult uh, other countries that are experienced in the field in order to find out how uh, how many new specialists we would need to start uh, operation of a new power plant according to experience uh, mentioned by other by some foreign specialists uh, we have heard that it's around 75 people that are needed to, to staff a new nuclear power plant for us as an industry as an energy industry it is uh, a positive uh, development we are looking for ways of uh, recruiting new specialists we are looking for ways to improve the image and, uh, the, and uh, the salary in our industry in general we believe that energy sector is uh, highly competitive as an employer and this is a sector that also helps to improve the quality of life both for public and uh, those involved in the sector directly on the one hand uh, we uh, it will be a challenge to ensure the training and education for all the necessary workforce and specialists but on the other hand uh, well it could become an invaluable invaluable uh, resource in the future at the moment we don't have a specific study program or laboratory dedicated to nuclear issues so a new uh, curricula should be developed uh, new laboratories should be equipped um, current uh, study programs should be reviewed and revised to include additional content related to nuclear issues and we should also think about ways of recruiting students for the newly made nuclear study programs when it comes to operation of the nuclear power plant it is necessary also to think about protective zones sanitary zones increased safety zones how to int introduce such areas how to maintain them and how to make and how to defend and protect their physical security it is also necessary to think about ways of uh, training specialists working in the nuclear power plant how to how to provide uh, emergency help in case of um, some disasters or incidents well and we also need to think about uh, natural security and defense nuclear energy is uh, well, an issue of national uh, security and it can be turned against us uh, to threaten our safety and security so we need to perform a, a thorough um, recruitment procedure and to to check uh, all the all the workers working in the construction site and all the potential uh, employees of the MPP. it's not so much about uh, specifically related to nuclear energy but to, to 
any type of energy. Energy is an issue of natural security. We have seen how uh, energy infrastructure can be can be used as a way of of uh, reducing countries' uh, independence. In, for instance, we, we we have seen several examples in uh, the current war inter, uh, started by Russia in Ukraine. Uh, other aspects to consider is um, agreement with other parties involved um, for for balancing the load and capacity of the nuclear power plant, emergency compensation conditions for market participation or financial guarantees, as well as we need to consider conditions for infrastructure funding, for, in, for instance, construction of uh, new power transmission lines or new roads, development of atmosphere and water basin monitoring system and other. It is also necessary to well, agree on conditions for using municipal or common water basins like uh, the Baltic Sea. That the same applies to using transport system and uh, common public roads. If a specific infrastructure is built and is dedicated for the needs of the nuclear power plant, then we also need how to balance need to think of how to balance its cost effectiveness so here you can see in the picture two strategically important um, uh, energy so, so pieces of energy infrastructures that are intersecting one of them is uh, natural gas pipeline from a uh, liquid liquefied natural gas uh, terminal and the other is two thread cable electricity cable so here are also places as you can see where those two strategically important strategically vital objects intersect as to the key political preconditions that are required for implementation for introducing of nuclear energy in latvia we need to uh, reassure this, this is the public that uh, nuclear energy is safe. And we need not only to work with awareness raising among the public, but also among industry specialists. The industry is willing, as well as the industry is looking for such decisions that are transparent that are beneficial for the industry and that have not been adopted in hurry the energy industry itself is interested in clear transparent decisions only then the industry can be sure that the investments are safe and the industry can rely on the return of its investments and its, and its efforts will well, will prove to be uh, productive. So these are the first steps to be taken in order to start a power plant deployment in Latvia. Thank you very much, but uh, for uh, uh, making the wheel turn, it's usually the price or different geopolitical aspects that help. Of course, one thing is that you tell everyone, but all of a sudden, the situation in the world uh, changes. But for example, Germany builds a gas pipeline or oil pipe pipeline, and now you can't use it. So, for example, imagine the war ends and everything goes back to normal. Again, the energy is cheap, everything is easy. But uh, imagine we don't think that uh, <clears throat> the situation will change and so is there uh, an idea that there might be a reverse progression recording stopped recording in progress i don't think uh, that really applies here the policy makers regulating institutions should avoid the situation that we saw in the previous decade where the prices couldn't really finance new investments in the field 
And um, that's why we are in the present situation. Because on a purely technical level, uh, if we look at how the prices have risen, we can see a correlation that uh, in the previous years, uh, manufacturers uh, and uh, nuclear operators in Scandinavia just closed the operation because uh, the prices were not rentable. But uh, <clears throat> uh, human work uh, in a society where uh, work is valued, it just human labor cannot become uh, cheaper. So these are limited resources and they shouldn't uh, become much, much cheaper. So if we look at steel and wood, they are cheap and it doesn't show that it's good and that it's sustainable. So the next speaker will be quite interesting, especially for you, Adam Blazowski. He's uh, from a country that we sometimes scold that they are not too creative or, or green in terms of energy because <clears throat> they use a lot of coal. But for Adam, it's an opportunity to show that Poland looks at smart uh, solutions. And um, he's uh, an expert on smart cities as well. So a pragmatic and Polish. So uh, two uh, things that Adam will combine in his presentation, please. Adam, the floor is yours. Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Adam Boszowski. I'm representing Polish uh, eco-humanist uh, uh, FOTA for climate. Or, uh, we are an NGO, a foundation. I'm one of the founders. Uh, as, as you mentioned, my background is a software engineer. I have been working all my life with smart city energy efficiency. Uh, with uh, renewable energy, so I am absolutely not uh, in any way related to, to nuclear energy, but we are environmentalists and we talk about nature protection and we talk about energy as a vital element uh, of, uh, of, um, of our life. And I will explain and tell you a little bit more about how we reached a conclusion that we need to talk about nuclear. So we started in 2019. We have, we are a foundation, but we have currently a couple hundred uh, people who are really actively supporting us and, and who see our uh, cause as valid and, and interesting. Uh, okay, so when we talk about climate change, we talk about uh, how the challenge is very hard to ignore. We have to reduce the CO2 emissions. And the, the later we do this, uh, the more we have to go into negative emissions in uh, 2050, 2060, 2080. So you see this by this yellow part of the chart. This comes from IPCC data. So what does this mean? It means that our children and grandchildren and our grand-grandchildren are going to build very expensive, very difficult uh, installations for retracting CO2 from, this, from the atmosphere. So instead of building hospitals and building uh, uh, aqua parks and schools and kindergartens, uh, they will need to spend significant amount of money on, clean, money on cleaning up our future uh, environment. So uh, this is not only about stopping emissions. We have to clean up. So you can imagine throwing uh, garbage into the forest. It's not enough to stop throwing garbage into the forest. You have to go to the forest and you have to pick up the garbage in the forest. And why is this important? It means that we have to abandon the traditional green narrative about uh, soft energy and, and reducing energy needs uh, because we are going to need much, much more energy right now than we need right now uh, because it comes from thermodynamics. If you make mess, it takes much more energy to clean up your mess than to make this mess. And since we have polluted our atmosphere, then if we are serious about stopping climate change and, and, and even uh, reversing it, 
we have to use a lot of energy. So obviously we all know what is what are the clean energy sources. This is not coal, this is not biomass, this is not natural gas, it's, uh, it's uh, renewables and nuclear power. And this is very clear that we have to use all resources that are at our end. Yeah, we, we are not in a position as a society to pick and choose and say, oh, we only want this or we want only that. Mm. The situation is so difficult that, that we have to use all. And this is, uh, this is only going to get harder. Uh, we in Europe can talk about energy efficiency and we should because we, there is plenty of uh, inefficiencies in Europe. Uh, but even if we are really good at it, uh, it's going to be dwarfed by whatever happens elsewhere. So this traditional narrative uh, that we have to reduce, reduce, and, and we have to use less energy is true because it's valuable to save energy. But on the other hand, we have to prepare ourselves as citizens of this planet for a massive, massive increase in the needs of energy. This is related to the people getting out of poverty uh, in India, China, Southeast Asia, Africa. Uh, and uh, the, the, the West and the North should not absolutely um, ignore the fact that they have to reduce their energy consumption. But overall, we are going to increase. So we will need much, much more. And uh, we find it detrimental to the whole narrative. Uh, there are a lot of, of, of green uh, narratives that talk about future with much, much less energy. We think it's counterproductive and we think it's not realistic. It's basically telling the people in poor countries that, sorry, you have to stay poor because we have damaged the climate uh, before uh, you. So now you have to stay poor and uh, you cannot grow. This is inhuman. This is uh, against the principles of humanism. So we have to combine together the needs of, of, of other societies to lift themselves out of poverty. And we have to combine it with the protection of the climate. And historically, uh, our movement towards uh, clean energy systems is really going nowhere. So you can see the, the, the renewables have increased largely. This is great. This is good for us. But only um, uh, in a small uh, percentage. So the overall need for energy has increased. So even with the current development of clean power and clean energy, we are not able to catch up to the growth of energy. So we are effectively standing still, still in one place uh, and we are not moving. One of the reasons why this is the case is because uh, in the West, uh, we have allowed ourselves to shut down nuclear power, uh, which is also low carbon, uh, but is replaced by, by renewables and gas. So this is, a, this is something that we see as a huge problem uh, because we... This is ruining our efforts. It's ruining our efforts to, uh, to decarbonize. So we, as, as, as FOTA, and, and I was doing the calculations, we, we thought, okay, what can we do as an environmental organization that we, that is the most forgotten topic? How can we stop uh, something or how can we prevent a, a bad decision that is the most forgotten, but really impacts uh, very strongly on, on, on the climate. And stopping the reverse or reversing the, the shutdown of nuclear power plants, we, we figured out it's really important. So if you look at Germany, a uh, German reactor produces about one gigawatt. Uh, if it, this reactor is replaced by the current uh, electricity mix in Germany, which emits about 430 gram CO2 per kilowatt hour. So just by, if I can extend the life of a German nuclear reactor by one hour, I can negate the CO2 emissions of all my life. So this sounds like a very worthy cause. So we as FOTA decided that it's, a, it's, it's an important thing to do. So we have uh, organized uh, a Polish uh, protest together with some nuclear people in Germany, in a power plant, uh, Philipsburg, Gronde, 
uh, and then we went to Berlin uh, to protest the nuclear phase out in Germany, uh, in Berlin. Yes. This was all before the war, and people didn't really uh, see this consequence. But right now, it's very clear that uh, that this is happening, and this this phase out, the nuclear phase out, is a disaster uh, in the making for the climate and for the energy systems. The German emissions are increasing for the second year, and they will increase on the next year also. So the, the grid intensity is increasing. So this is this is what's happening. On the other hand, we are absolutely pro renewable energy, uh, except that the whole concept of renewable energy is very poisonous because it includes biomass, and uh, wood and wood products accounted for almost forty five percent of EU gross inland energy consumption of renewables in two thousand sixteen. And so, as environmentalists, we are very much against use of biomass for heating the cities. Uh, if we allow this, Denmark is, is really leading this, and Denmark is, is really going for 100% biomass by 2035. This is a disaster uh, for the environment because the demand for biomass is increasing so much that uh, even very valuable uh, forests are being cut. There has been a very... Uh, loud uh, mm, protest from Estonia. The pro-Estonian environmentalists have issued a paper to Denmark that they are really burning Estonian uh, and Latvian trees in their um, district heating plants. So we have to be sure that not every renewable source is really clean. So just the concept of 100% renewable um, uh, uh, energy system is abhorrent uh, from the environment uh, perspective because we, we cannot destroy the environment to save it. Uh, and so certainly biomass, it's okay for wind and solar in the right locations, but it's certainly not okay for us, for the biomass uh, industry. And we see a huge increase of the, of the, uh, of the, of the biomass demand. Uh, on the market, which affects a nuclear spares nature. I do not have a Polish translation for that, but uh, but uh, I will translate that. This is uh, uh, on the on the vertical. I don't know if you see my mouse, but on the vertical on oh, sorry on horizontal lines on the columns we have coal and gas, then we have renewables, and then we have nuclear, and then we value them according to fuel uh, length and materials and emissions. So fuel uh, per terawatt hour, uh, coal and gas, they need a lot of fuel. Renewables, they need some fuel. Maybe for wind and solar, they don't need it. But for biomass, they certainly need fuel. Nuclear needs very little fuel. So that's an advantage for nuclear power. Land is, again, very little for coal and gas, but very large for uh, renewables. Renewables need a lot of land. And nuclear needs very little land. If you look to a German uh, power plant on the area of two or three hectares, you can produce as much energy as all wind turbines in Denmark. So it's significant uh, benefit for the environment if you have a nuclear in your energy mix, because this land sparing is very important. Certainly for biofuels, uh, it's much better to create synthetic fuels with nuclear than produce biofuels from farming where you actually cannibalize the food production. And materials, uh, it's uh, coal and gas, they don't need much materials, but uh, renewables, they do need a lot of materials, uh, silver and, and uh, steel and aluminum. And, and nuclear is very friendly. Uh, per terawatt hour for materials. And of course, emissions. Renewables are, are clean and nuclear is clean, but coal and gas are uh, very polluting. So in the end, if you look from the, from the nature's perspective, we are environmentalists, then nuclear is really the way to go because it has very low uh, fuel demand. It has very low land and needs little materials and has no emissions. So it's really no brainer for the environment. So we act, we do. Uh, we have started the campaign Save Climate, Support Nuclear in Poland. So hundreds and thousands of people have put this on their profile. 
uh, on on Facebook and uh, other social media. And this is how we help people to come out as pro-nuclear uh, in an easy and a safe way. Because historically, if you were pro-nuclear, you were often attacked or, or confronted by anti-nuclear activists. Uh, today, it's the other way around. Uh, nuclear has a very large support for Poland in Poland. And actually, if you are anti-nuclear, then, then you you have to explain yourself. And, and among the, the climate um, environmental movements, it is not a good uh, idea to, to be against nuclear just as much as it's not a good idea to be against renew renewables because our true enemy is coal and gas. What else do we do as, as FOTA? Uh, we are doing a program moratorium for trees. So we fight, and this is our core project, we fight to change the law so the trees and urban trees are not removed and cut and destroyed because we see this uh, on a large extent, partly because the demand for biomass is growing so high. And the urban trees are really important because they are part of our critical infrastructure for climate mitigation and adaptation. They lower temperature in the cities, they provide biodiversity and they keep water and uh, when we have drought. So we have to consider both nuclear and trees our critical climate infrastructure. They, they are very similar. Both are disappearing for the same reason. Nuclear power plants are disappearing because people don't know why they were built and what is the reason they are existing. This is the same with trees. People do not know why the trees are important in the cities, so the trees are disappearing. The only thing in your mental model about the tree is that it can fall down and kill somebody or that you can cut it. This is the, the main mental model of the, of the people. And the same is with nuclear power. The only mental model about nuclear power plant for people is that it can explode. So this is a similar case where a very valuable technology or, or uh, infrastructure like, like urban trees or nuclear power plant is wasted and not appreciated because we are not conscious that it's important for our lives and it's important for the climate. Other things we are issuing uh, uh, open letters and getting signatures uh, to the government about the drought in Poland. We have severe problems uh, with the drought. Uh, we are um, investigating forests and biomass markets and the biomass industry uh, to use and use the standards and F uh, FSC standards for biomass uh, collection. Very often uh, these certificates are completely bogus and we really go to the forest, we make photographs, we show the auditors uh, of the certificates that the, the, the uh, local forest industry is not ob ob following the rules and then uh, they have to explain themselves and even sometimes lose the certificate which means they will get less money for for the material that they have so they have to follow the the, the, the rules uh, by the european union and we do these investigations and of course we did a very uh, widely discussed uh, open letter of Polish scientists against the uh, closure of German nuclear power plants. We send it, more than 100 Polish scientists have, have signed it. We send it to the embassy, we send it to the Bundestag, we send it to the uh, Academy of Science in Germany to, to really reconsider the atom Ausstieg and, and uh, really consider climate as priority. Uh, interestingly, this was completely ignored. We have never received uh, a formal reply um, our protest uh, in Berlin, we we invited Professor James Hansen uh, to the to the Brandenburg Gate. We also protest in Poland together with Extinction Rebellion, uh, with Fridays for Future. Uh, this is a photo from our protest in front of a bank that wanted to uh, support coal uh, industry. So we are absolutely cooperating with uh, with uh, climate movements uh, because we have common goals. Uh, sometimes we may be differ on nuclear, but uh, even then we absolutely see no problem in cooperating together. And last but not least, uh, we have we are one of the founders of a, of a new 
European-wide organization that's called Replanet. Replanet is a coalition of uh, eco-humanist uh, organizations in um, uh, all over uh, Europe. And FOTA was, was one of the first uh, founders of this. So right now we have uh, we have someone in Finland, in Sweden, in Belgium, Netherlands, Germany, Poland, and we are looking Slovakia, uh, Austria. We are looking for for uh, similar like-minded uh, organizations, and our slogan is "Liberate Nature, Elevate Humanity." And you can already see a very stark difference between traditional environmentalism, who was really anti-human. Uh, but we want to talk about both. We want to liberate nature and we want to uh, elevate humanity because it's not fair that some people don't have electricity in 2022. Yeah? Our most recent campaign is Switch of Putin. Uh, I encourage you to go on Twitter and retweet it. We want to, uh, we have calculated, we, we don't just shout. We really like numbers and we really have planned and we really have... Uh, an idea how to do this. We want to switch off Putin and we have to go on to cut Europe from fossil fuels from Russia. We have ideas how to do this. And uh, I really encourage you to go to Twitter and uh, see for yourself. Uh, Mark Linus, the famous environmentalist, has done a short video about how to do this and he has the numbers. So I really encourage you to go to Twitter, Replanet and Geo. Uh, let's Replanet. This is our handle. And if you want to follow us on Twitter, it's uh, Photo for Climate and me, Adam Brzozowski. We are uh, there and we are available for you to, um, to answer your questions or help you or uh, discuss. Uh, maybe you think we are wrong. So <laughs> uh, we are also very open to this. We, are, we, we don't have all the answers and we are absolutely... Uh, this is something that's characteristic for us, is that we are absolutely positive about changing our mind about things. And, and, and changing our mind about nuclear was, was very important for us. And actually, when you're wrong and you change your mind, it's uh, not a moment, it's not something to be ashamed. It is something to celebrate and even uh, uh, appreciate because you are wrong. And now you know you are wrong and you know more. So you, your knowledge is better. So this is what the modern environmentalism should look like. The modern environmentalism should be pragmatic. It should be not afraid of questions. It should not be dogmatic. And this is what we want to build. And we want to build it on the European scale. Thank you. This is... Thank you for That's being everything. also pragmatic uh, in the sense of not putting only blacks and white colors. Still, we yes. have one uh, quick question here from people who would like to know about this black substance, about the coal. Uh, yeah. How different is the percentage? Does it differ at all because of this Russian crisis of a local coal that is mined in Inside the Poland and used for energy production, we we, we had these uh, discussions a little bit before. Uh, if yeah. you have some excuses, maybe now because of the war, you know, stick to the older yeah. traditions. Don't uh, uh, fill up uh, the promises we gave to ourselves for a green uh, deal of mm -hmm. EU and, yeah. and the world. So, so seventy percent of energy in Poland comes from coal, and almost everything is domestic. There is and it used to be an import uh, from Russia and from mm -hmm. Donbas, specifically from Donbas. Uh, yeah. This is really hard to, to, to explain. Uh, it's immoral uh, to import uh, coal from, from Russia that comes from Donbas. So this has recently been banned by the Polish government. So it's not legal anymore to import coal uh, from, from Russia to Poland. Yeah, of course. Um, the current situation and the gas prices means that it's much cheaper to burn coal than gas. You can see it in Germany, you can see it in Poland. So we have our core power plants, coal power plants are running at 100% right now because it's much cheaper than, than gas. So it's very unhealthy. But we have been protesting against the idea of gas as a transition fuel uh, over nuclear for a long time, because this is exactly the result of, of, of 
this wrong thinking. If we allow ourselves to transition from coal to gas, then we are going to lock in ourselves for the next 14 years because you have to build infrastructure, pipes and new plants. This is a disaster that we observe right now in Belgium, for example. Belgium wants to shut down five reactors, which is like 30% of their energy mix. It's, it's, it's horrible. They're going to replace it mainly with gas. So, um, yeah, this uh, coal, coal imports from Russia are right now banned. Uh, Putin also uh, closed our gas supply. Um, so we are completely switching, putting off uh, yes. as we speak. Yes, and, and, and hopefully we will manage uh, beside uh, the, the, the realities we will face anyway, it is going to uh, yes. going to be politics as well uh, inside this all decisions we are discussing today. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, Adam, thank you for being uh, so yes. kind to give us uh, a <laughs> nice, nice, actually realistic um, picture of your country, which very much uh, is a flagmanship in uh, actually this region as such. So hope to. If, I, if I can, if I can just one, oh, uh, please. add one sen one sentence. Uh, of course. In 1989. We have been building our own nuclear power plant, Sharnovitz, that's by the north in the Baltic Sea. And this project was killed by the Solidarity Movement, uh, which won with the yeah. communists, because Solidarity was very well uh, established with the coal industry. And together with environmentalists, they have killed it. And uh, because this project was killed in 1991, a new coal power plant in Opole, uh, Western Poland, was built. So instead of building a nuclear power plant, we have <coughs> built a coal power plant. Mm -hmm. And this was this is this is the legacy of the old environmental movement in Poland. And they have to live with this. Uh, on the other hand, Slovakia was in the same situation. In Slovakia, uh, they stopped the product of the building, but then they continue. And now they are going to finish it. Uh, and in two years, Slovakia is going to have 100% clean uh, energy in their energy system. So uh, Germany is maybe going to get off coal in 2038, maybe. And Slovakia is going to be decarbonizing the energy sector in 2024. So just uh, think about it and think what it means for the environment and the climate. Yeah. So Thank sometimes you. it is even better to be a kind of smaller country, not the big yeah. country. So in this sense, I'm for Slovaks, you know, supporting yes. uh, their choice. And, <laughs> and in a way, they are very comparable yeah. to Latvia. Actually, the size of the uh, GDP of Latvia and Slovakia is more or less yeah. the same size. So yes. good luck for uh, your country's transformation. Good luck for our country's transformation. Nevertheless, we switch back to Latvian. Un nav visvaldas grāveris ir ieņēmis ļoti interesantu pozīciju Liepājā, pilnīgi ļoti. Uh, Mr. Visvaldas grāveris is actually now located in Liepāja. It is very close to the spot which was once considered as a potential location for building a, a nuclear power plant. It is near Pavelos. Visvaldas uh, grāveris uh, used to work in the Institute for Solid State Physics and uh, at the and um, at the moment, uh, he is uh, he is working in an institution uh, that is responsible for assessing uh, safety of different things, and he will talk about uh, rocky road of uh, nuclear energy in Latvia and globally. Uh, in fact, I'm not any more active working in uh, as, an, as, as, a, as a safety and security e uh, expert in, in environmental agency. I am now retired. Uh, briefly about me, I haven't been involved in nuclear energy, but uh, I have worked with radiation throughout my all professional career. At first, I worked in uh, researching of radiation effect in crystals in the solid state uh, physics institute i have also been inv been involved in latvian gamma mon uh, gamma radiation monitoring and early response system deployment and data monitoring for almost 20 years 
from the point of view of radiation, I would like to explain why our road of developing nuclear energy is, uh, is, a, is a rocky one and it goes with ups and downs. Well, the history of using nuclear energy started with, an, with the dramatic event, bombardment of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. One might argue if that was necessary, but after it was only after the war, there was a thought of using this fantastic source of energy for peaceful purposes. There were high hopes vested to the nuclear energy. It was a new, practically non-depletable source of energy million-folds more powerful than conventional sources of fossil energy. It, it was billion-folds more powerful than solar and the wind energy. The whole atmosphere was euphoric, and people believed that there will be such an amount of cheap energy that it will be too cheap to even meter, but something went wrong. I don't know what happened and when we took the wrong turn, but the whole development of nuclear energy was halted. Well, as to the first reactors and nuclear power plants, so how, how fast did we uh, so how fast we moved from the first reactor to nowadays so the first reactor which uh, demonstrated the first chain reaction was chicago pile one it was launched by enrico fermi the extraordinary physician in experimental physics uh, the estonian company fermi energy was named after him in 1951, December 20, that is nine years after Chicago Pile 1 in Idaho, the first experimental reactor was launched to, to generate electricity. It was EBR-1, with uh, quite uh, a moderate uh, power of 0 0.2 megawatts of electricity. The actual period or the actual era of nuclear energy started uh, in 1956 in, with, with the launching of Calder Hall 1 reactor in the UK. It was built in three years. And in the upcoming 10 years, 23 more nuclear reactors were uh, built in the UK. And uh, the first reactor, Calder 1, was actually officially opened by the current British Queen Elizabeth II. Well, many people don't know the fact that Brits remained the leaders in nuclear energy on global scale until 1970. Until 1970s, and the lead was taken over by the US in 1970. In 1974, it was taken over by Japan, 76 by Germany, 78 by France, and 1979, the, the Soviet Union became the, the global leader in nuclear energy. The maximum, the maximum pace or the peak of uh, construction of new reactors was reached in 1975. Uh, during that year, 40 new reactors were launched into construction phase. That is, one new reactor was started to, to be constructed in nine days. Calder was built in three years, previous reactors in four years, but now the most modern European reactor nowadays was built in 17 years, and the total budget in, has inc increased the initial or, or original uh, estimates by several billions of euros. It also takes has been taking quite a lot of time to finish the ITER reactor in France. It is quite a lengthy project. Nuclear power plants have been launched on submarines and on uh, different ships and other vessels. But we, but still sometimes it takes years and years 
of uh, actually implementing the nuclear energy and putting it into operation. So why is it so? It is because the anti-nuclear activists and the propagandists are very active and quite powerful. I know that we are lagging behind the schedule, so I will skip a few slides. So as to counter arguments, why some people uh, claim that nuclear energy is bad, somebody says that it's uh, dangerous. And here is comparison of nuclear energy and aviation. We are not afraid of uh, stepping on a plane, but uh, we somehow have unreasonable fear against nuclear energy. Some claim that nuclear energy is expensive, and here you can see the building cost of low carbon electricity. Even Even the even uh, even with the new newly constructed Finnish uh, nuclear reactors, it took so many years of building, and uh, it will still be cheaper than other types of uh, energy generation. Nuclear power plants uh, have service life that is two or three fold longer than uh, the service life of wind or solar power plants. The same applies to the argument that um, nuclear power plants uh, take very, very much time to, to, to be constructed. Well, the first, it, it was true with the first nuclear power plants because there was no experience in building such a new construction. EBR took four years to be built, Calder Hall, three years. But now we have had 20,000 reactor years of experience in construction. So it it is not a lengthy process anymore. The exaggerated fear from radiation and the exaggerated misleading response is based on the um, on the wrongful uh, hypothesis by uh, Mr. Henry Miller in his no uh, Noble lecture, where and and it was simply taken as a, as a paradigm. Some say that nuclear power is not natural, but even Paracelsus, a scientist who who lived. Um, who li who lived several centuries ago knew that uh, uh, medicines or uh, the difference between medicines and poison is simply less simply in the dose. There are no experiments to prove that radiation is uh, dangerous if it's used in the correct doses. So here are a couple of examples from my experience or experience in Latvia. So these examples are to il illustrate that um, all the charges put on radiation are exaggerated and they are not substantiated. I started doubting the current radiation norms for the first time when I understood that um, rain the train in some places of the world is at least ten, tenfold more radioactive than uh, 
than the radiation standards or the radiation limits stipulated in our laws and regulations. So people living with much higher levels of background radiations and there have been stipulated in laws and regulations and somehow they don't die off simply for that reason. In Daugavpils, there are the so-called uh, snow white uh, spheres or these white spheres that monitor the radiation in the atmosphere. These, uh, these are built, these are monitoring stations built by Finnish companies. The, the monitoring stations analyze uh, several thousands of cubic meters of air to detect cesium and berkelium amount in the air. Cesium is uh, a technogenic origin, is a technogenic origin because it's not uh, present from natural sources. And Becquerel A, a, ber a beryllium is a, is a natural isotope that is present in, a, in nature. And it is measured in mini becquerels per uh, cubic meter. And the background radiation present in Daugavpils uh, was um, much higher than previously considered uh, uh, recommended in some laws and regulations. Um, another proof for safety of radiation um, was demonstrated in 2016 in Helsinki in Radiation Safety Institute. Uh, so uh, this, the same Snow White uh, monitoring sphere detected a billion fold uh, increase in, the, in a background cesium radiation. And the director of the scientific institute in, in uh, Helsinki, Tika Ika Heimonen, in a press release said that only in case of a billion rather than million fold uh, increase in cesium uh, background radiation, it would be necessary to think about uh, measures of evacuating uh, people. So it, so she confirms that million fold increase in uh, background cesium radiation is not a problem and it could be related uh, probably to tests performed with uh, nuclear weapons in Chernobyl or something like that. So director Ika Heimonen confirms that only in case of a billion fold increase in background radiation of cesium it would be necessary to consider measures for evacuating uh, people. It simply also means that the current uh, monitoring systems are able to detect uh, such levels of radiation that are really minimal. Unfortunately, different people who are against uh, all things new, including uh, nuclear power or who are lobbying for other types of energy are, are using this information and to monger fear among the society. Another proof for the safety of radiation was shown in 2018 in Getlini landfill. Uh, increased uh, radiation levels, so increased uh, cesium level. Cesium level was detected. So it was uh, like six fold above the 
upper limit stipulated in law and um, there were heated discussions on whether it's possible to um, deposit whether it's possible to utilize or de well de deposit the respective waste in the landfill or or should it be disposed of in some kind in a, in a different way and we as scientists uh, calculated that in order to uh, suffer from acute radiation syndrome with, at, at such level of radiation, the radioactive waste in the landfill should be eaten in amounts of several hundreds of kilograms. And it would take uh, consumption of more than a, well, oral consumption of more than a thousand of radioactive waste that to to die off that i was also involved in the helcom Mars program that is a program for monitoring the pollution in baltic sea and uh, global oceans it is dedicated uh, to radioactive cons uh, pollution and the helcom Mars project involved specialists from all the countries surrounding the baltic sea Many people probably are not aware of the fact that the, Bal the Baltic Sea is the most pol polluted sea in the world when it comes to the content of cesium and strontium. It is the level of cesium is still between 30 to 40 becquerels per cubic meter. However, in during the research that have spanned over 30 years, no harmful pollution or no harmful effect on flora and fauna in, of the Baltic Sea was detected. Also, no harmful effect was detected on people living by the, the Baltic Sea. What is interesting is that the content of cesium in water reduces by half, not in not in 20 years, but uh, even in uh, 10 years. And alongside with uh, the natural uh, destruction, also cesium and cesium de deposits accumulate somewhere in water. Uh, I am a, I am an expert who has always been involved in uh, pollution monitoring in uh, waters, and I was interested in uh, the pollution levels after the Fukushima emergency and Fukushima catastrophe. When water reached the western bank of the United States, uh, the internet was full of uh, false news on uh, fish dying off in crazy amounts and i looked uh, at the monitoring data and uh, it showed that cesium content in water after fukushima uh, catastrophe had increased by two to four times in the waters of the Pacific Ocean. It reached only four to six becquerels per cubic meter. It is a negligible amount compared to the natural activity, radioact, radioactivity of the ocean water. So the natural background radioactivity in ocean is measured in 12,000 becquerels per cubic meter. Uh, unfortunately, we are running out of time. Could you could you please just try to wrap up your presentation? Here, I would also like to reiterate one more thing. A boy called Michal Koss uh, shared his thoughts uh, on Facebook and he compared uh, natural radiation level with, uh, with the level of uh, Chernobyl. 
And he asked a rhetoric question, is radiation in fact dangerous? And if radiation is not dangerous, as we have been always told, then all the counter arguments that, that to deny uh, nuclear power and to object nuclear energy, they are all just useless and they are based on nothing. Probably we don't need all those exaggerated safety systems and nuclear energy could become really cheap. Probably the most difficult uh, thing is uh, to admit that for over 40 and 50 years, uh, the energy policy has been based on lies on lies that have made nuclear energy a culprit. So you can also read an article on the internet and it's about, and it's called, oh, those funny nuclear waste. Uh, everything that I have to say about nuclear waste can be easily found on the internet. But uh, what I can briefly say is that the amount of nuclear waste is incredibly small, it's tiny and the requirement to, to dispose of uh, nuclear waste uh, in a very deep uh, geograph uh, geologically stable underground uh, repositories uh, well i believe there's no it's not, it's unjustified and it's simply giving up our positions uh, in towards the anti-nuclear activists. In fact, what is necessary is just uh, two and a half meters de uh, deep layer of water to prevent uh, the radiation release uh, from, uh, from a nuclear power plant. The aim of anti-nuclear activists is simply to make things more difficult and to make uh, construction of uh, nuclear power plants more uh, well more expensive and uh, not to give up on fossil fuel because somebody is probably getting their money from uh, fossil fuels. Well, what are my conclusions? So nuclear energy is one of the basic sources of energy alongside uh, with fossil energies and others. But nuclear energy can be considered an essential source of energy. And uh, according to physics, uh, the laws of physics, uh, one essential source of energy can only be replaced with another essential source of energy. So at the moment, we see quite a quite high uh, competition and uh, uh, increased activities by nuclear uh, protesters. If we moved to nuclear energy, we wouldn't have to think of uh, all the well of all the problems and challenges related to other renewable sources of energy. Uh, like solar energy or wind energy, which are still quite challenging to be generated, obtained and uh, uh, collected. However, we somehow tend to follow the lead of the nuclear um, protesters. And we follow the, the lead of those who want to compete with nuclear energy for If you remember the history of uh, building and, de and deploying of uh, nuclear reactors, well, at first, uh, well, at first it took several years to build the first and the second nuclear power plant, and then in 1970s the peak was reached with several new uh, nuclear reactors built uh, in uh, every nine days. So it means that we could also build a nuclear power plant in Latvia. In, but the problem is not, uh, is, not, is not related to construction or finances, but rather the lack of uh, 
awareness in society. We need to work with society. We need to break the stereotypes and biases against the nuclear energy. Otherwise, everything is meant for failure. We need to educate the society that radiation is not as bad as some claim it to be. And also, Professor Wade Ellison showed it in his presentation in different graphs. Without uh, educating the society, without breaking the stereotypes and um, misconceptions, we won't be able to deploy nuclear energy in Latvia. Austria built a nuclear power plant, but didn't launch it because society was mongered against and uh, to stand against the nuclear energy and uh, society and public requested it never to be commissioned also the same applies to visagina nuclear power plant in lithuania but times change this well this yes times change and austria has not still had a courage uh, to reinstate its uh, nuclear force. Yes, but it was during the peaceful times and now it's a war time and it's a different time. Yes, also during the war, especially during the war, we need to educate the society. We have to start with children, with school children, with pupils, with students in high schools and then move on. Okay, but let us agree. We published this conference on Delphi. It is an internet portal, news portal, and everybody who's looking for facts can have a look at that. Uh, organizers will also publish everything on YouTube, but this well, this, you will go to visit schools in Leopaya, your colleagues will visit schools in other places in uh, Latvia, and they will, and we will take care of information raising. Thank you, this well, this, we know that the Riga Technical University is. Well, this is a very important part of materials, and today's item, your colleague Andrei Krasnikov, Kungulu. Excellent. Andrei, you are doctor, so let's get to the start. Andrei, it's uh, your turn, so you will be uh, telling us a secret on a new type of concrete that will uh, serve uh, a new cosmic te cosmic technologies uh, for. Uh, disposing of nuclear waste so it's a different kind of concrete what is it how is it different please show us the formula thank you dear listeners i would like to inform you on new materials which are linked to nuclear energy so just a few words on this conference so this is uh, one of the first steps uh, directed at uh, educating um, and interesting about the Latvian society on what kind of energy do we use. And unfortunately, uh, the events in the world have led to the situation where we're trying to uh, renew our information. And scientists have to be given the green light in this case uh, because they're not agitating for a cause they just give knowledge and a society without knowledge can have uh, uh, very faulty decisions which might have a high cost in the future so in this conference we want to evaluate and take a look at what is uh, uh, nuclear energy as a source of energy so in society there is a prevailing thought that it is different uh, it is something dangerous so there have been only three uh, malfunctions and in, in in the history of nuclear reactors and that was led only to 15 percent people supporting nuclear in the world but of course if you have such a huge amount of energy concentrated in one spot it is a bomb that means you have to work very profes professionally and consequently and carefully in order to avoid mistakes. If we make small reactors, we lower this risk uh, created uh, with 
the use of uh, this source of energy. I'd like to talk about a project that is um, purposefully and unpurposefully uh, related to uh, the Riga Technical University, and we are specialists in, in this type of concrete, because the project actually arrived from our northern neighbors in Estonia. And it's clear why. It's because they are many steps ahead of us in the construction of uh, uh, low power uh, uh, nuclear reactors. They already have uh, projects for this and they are sure that this project can be made into a reality. And I'm sure that uh, in time, Latin society will support such a, such a project so i will show you why next slide please oh i have it myself so uh, people involved here are uh, scientists from university of tartu the riga technical university the lithuanian energy institute which is directly linked to ignalina and the arctic university of norway so the base of the project is concrete concrete which have concretes which have new ingredients first of all they use uh, ash from estonia which is accumulated by burning oil shale uh, in estonia for that happened for a long time and secondly using technologies that uh, used uh, fiber concretes which uh, can uh, screen or protect from neutron uh, rays if we take a look at uh, this the question is quite broad so what type of radioactive waste is there and uh, how does the International Energy Agency advise you deal with such waste? Should you bury it? Should you treat it chemically? Should you recycle it? So in this graph from the International Energy Agency, we have... Uh, we have a comparison of types of radioactive waste. So the first type, the least uh, least dangerous one is the exempt waste, which actually do not exist in some uh, uh, countries. They, there are no regulations that exist that regulate uh, the, the disposal of exempt waste. So next is um, next type of waste which is linked to uh, to a short limited time of uh, use of radionuclides. Usually uh, they arrive uh, from the medicinal field and medicinal appliances. So, so second next we have a very low level waste uh, which has four different uh, gradations so they're in the very low level waste which are linked to just a small amount of waste it's written on the slide i can't talk about each of them in detail now so now we have low level waste then we have intermediate level waste and finally high level waste so we will be talking about all of the types of radioactive waste and not only radioactive waste chemical waste as well so uh, it's a model of the green uh, european green recycling model and this project uh, is within this framework so this is the traditional uh way 
that radioactive waste is discovered, um, treated. And again, I won't be talking about each point individually. So you collect them, sort them, chemical adjustments are made, etc., etc. And at the end, they are buried. And uh, one of the main uh, types uh, how this burial takes place is cementation. So how you fix this these uh, this waste in vessels so and how do you use concrete in these uh, vessels so here's a picture from Ignalina a nuclear reactor I took it off the internet uh, these pictures so in Ignalina nuclear plant there will be a me intermediate and low radioactivity uh, waste depository on the left, we see uh, see radioactive uh, pieces of um, of, uh, of material from um, from the uh, reactor, and then they're cemented, like in the in the picture there, and then they're put in uh, in different types of containers. So here we have a picture from the Lithuanian energy institute so different types of vessels or casks for a radioactive waste so it's actually uh used or disposed radioactive fuel is actually stored there so different models different uh widths of the walls so and the ones that are used uh, here are all of them have concrete in them. I was uh, quite surprised that the Lithuanian Energy Institution provided us with the regulations. And the regulations were as follows, that concrete has to be ordinary, simple. Dear friends, you know, there was a revolution in the concrete industry 10 to 15 years ago, and there completely different materials were created that uh, your average uh, inhabitant of Riga wouldn't really know about. So there are composite materials created out of concrete. So here we have classification of different types of concretes in different places. So conventional concrete, it's used here in uh, Riga. So all of uh, Riga has been built on uh, on concrete which is uh, has a strength of uh, 45 megapascal then we have high strength concrete that has over 100 megapascals and then we have high performance concrete 150 and upwards ultra high performance 160 and upwards and our students at uh, Riga Technical University actually have created 500 megapascal strong concrete which is twice as strong as steel and how do you achieve that well it is very dense it's not even concrete anymore it's almost like glass and without a doubt radioactive waste has two problems first of all rays radiation and the second problem leaching right so radioactive isotopes for example, in 50 years, 60 years, migrate outside of the concrete. So if you create a concrete that is uh, a barrier, we cannot await any leaching. So that's the object of our study, and that is what we want to uh, advise you to use. As on the slide, you can see the main requirements for concrete are density. Well, the higher, the better. We put lead pieces in it. Something from the Liepaja metal processing plant. And of course, something else that is bad is fragility. And if there's all of these deposit materials are added in, uh, in the vessels, and after a time, uh, ground waters will make it appear in, I don't know, in Yurmala on the beach. 
and there's all of a sudden there's radiation on the beach well that is something that would be absolutely unacceptable so the uh, characteristics of uh, concrete that have been achieved now uh, uh, in comparison with the concrete that was used uh, for burying radioactive waste as now they are the characteristics or properties are much higher and we have to use modern materials different materials we do not need fragility we will not strive for density we will have this uh, screening capacity or shielding capacity so what i want to talk about is uh, fiber concrete uh, concrete fiber in Latvia, it's quite uh, a developed market. We are a knowledgeable country in this field. We have actually outperformed American, Scandinavian manufacturers with our knowledge and our uh, specialists uh, from the Riga Technical University, and we know how to use it. So what is fiber concrete? So when you add little fibers to the concrete, it doesn't allow for micro uh, cracks to appear in the concrete so so what are these micro cracks so concrete is basically like a rock uh, sponge and through the sponge of course you get uh, humidity passing through it and if you close the gaps you don't get the humidity you don't get the water so here we see different fibers used glass fibers uh, poly uh, boron we have polypropylene boron and uh, different uh, other fibers and we here we have some knowledge that arrived to us from tartu with a specialist from ukraine they have uh, tried to get the basalt boron fibers so they have a publication here and when basalt, uh, basalt fibers were used, we do not have such appliances. Definitely, the Valmiera plant will not uh, be too happy about that. So, uh, but the uh, people in Tartu got these types of uh, appliances, and uh, they achieved great results. And boron ten is an isotope that uh, catches uh, warmth neutrons heat neutrons and if you use such uh, fiber concretes with such uh, fibers with such high performance uh, concrete with uh, with uh, with uh, the material I meant the ash I mentioned from from Estonia it will not allow the leaking of radioactive material anywhere it can suffer and it can leave the container in 60 70 years etc etc so we're on the right right track here are the experiments that were already performed we see how they were checked with radioactive uh, uh, radiation and now just a few words on the estonian oil shale ash in estonia ash oil shale has been uh, burned for hundreds of years and uh, it's not used too much now because one ton of oil shale burnt gives us half a ton of ash so it's literally mountains of ash and Estonians are interested if we can use them in a positive way and maybe if it's a material you could use in the building of new nuclear reactors and we are uh, thriving to uh, <clears throat> create new materials so uh, the conclusions are we will have new innovative fiber concretes that uh, will shield from neutrons and lastly it will have such radionuclides uh, uh, 
that will prevent uh, leaching of hazardous materials as well. So, for example, maybe <laughs> you might just imagine you might have this uh, concrete vessel heating your home, maybe. It can't even <clears throat> explode. So, I'm calling the Latvian society to consider the thought that everything changes over time. So, maybe it is worthwhile to think that we will be a nation that will be one of the most developed uh, we will be the ones to use the most innovative technologies. So, for example, we'll start producing robots, we'll start uh, creating new computers, well, maybe not computers, but either way, we will start manufacturing a lot of things, and I'm waiting for that moment. I want to uh, see it. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation i'm also looking forward to this moment in fact all those innovative materials are definitely among uh, the uh, for, uh, the leaders in our ex export capacity well this is also this is also like a, a co-founding factor it's perfect since the since a fresh breath in our industry is given by the science and we have so, so many innovations well it means that our future will be bright the next speaker will be from us she will not be from estonia she will be from us and us is also a country that knows quite a great deal about uh, science mr meredith Hello. hello 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 can you so, hear me yes we absolutely hear you can you and, hear me yes we do and and, and welcome and, and and sorry for being so early for you uh, but still we had already some uh, interesting inserts and inputs and now we very much like to uh, talk this how the capacity and capability of the grid should be developed or re installed or redeveloped or what should we do with this you've been working on on this issue for many years uh, as a chemistry uh, professor and um, scientist and uh, there are several books i su should suggest we will publish uh, them um, in the background as well so uh, many people would like to read uh, the books as well but well, anyway let's put it uh, a little bit shorter today we'd like to hear you from uh, uh, what do you think could be uh, these things we shouldn't neglect before we do our uh, political or technical decisions, please. I just, I want to be sure you can hear me, literally yes. hear me. Can you hear yes, me? Yes, okay, we good. do, but good, uh, good. please, could you also share uh, so we can double check with if uh, the share is working? Oh, the sh I oh. have the screen up there. It's, I think All right, I, there is. I think, okay, okay. So this is, uh, this is the conference we're all at, so I don't think that's a surprise to anybody. Yes. Um, and I'm trying to move to the next uh, slide. Uh, and uh, the role of nuclear energy on the grid is, the import, is, is what I'm going to be talking about today. I'm not really going to be talking about nuclear per se, though I, I've worked in that field a lot and I have books on it. It's going to be about the grid because I've been studying the grid for about 12 years. And people don't, people, I had to write a book. It's so complicated sometimes that, anyway. So let's talk about what we want before we talk about what's going on. We want a strong grid. And what is the definition of a strong grid, in my opinion? A strong grid is a reliable grid. I, I can't emphasize that enough. Because as uh, one of my friends, Robert Bryce, says, if there's not a reliable grid, people will do what they have to to make it reliable. So if you think, oh, we want it to be relatively inexpensive, well, if it isn't reliable, the rich people will have uh, uh, um, generators at home and the poor people won't. So what I'm trying to say is we want reliable electricity and, 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 and next to that, we want relatively inexpensive electricity so everyone can use it and uh, electricity made with low levels of pollution. But reliability is key. Now, what makes it, oh, sorry about that. How, what makes it, 
what makes a grid messed up? What messes up a grid and makes it unreliable? What makes it unreliable is um, that it has uh, over-reliance on renewables. Renewables start and stop on their own schedule. Nobody commands the wind. Nobody commands the sun. Nobody commands the clouds. Now, I, I gave a talk to some engineering students actually yesterday, and I made a point of showing the grid operator's room, the room where there are people watching the weather. There are people watching the grid. There are people watching the frequency. This is not a trivial thing that, the, that, that you can't order a, a, a renewable plant online. Well, of course, we back up the renewable plants, and in general, we back them up with natural gas. Natural gas is delivered just in time through pipelines. Unlike uh, material which is stored on site, which is coal and uh, uh, nuclear and oil, natural gas is delivered just in time by pipelines. And in most areas of the world, I certainly don't, haven't done a huge study of all areas, but in most areas of the world, homes that heat with natural gas have the priority on the gas that's in the pipelines. So if there's a power plant that needs natural gas to make power, but it's a real cold snap and a lot of homes need natural gas, that power plant may not be able to get natural gas. Uh, we have seen this in, um, in Texas. That was a kind of a wake up for everybody. When I first wrote about it, it was about a near miss in New England. And uh, when I wrote about it, uh, and, and it was really a close one, in my opinion, uh, there were people who said, well, you know, you're exaggerating. I said, I don't think I am. You're alarmist. I don't think I am. Well, ever since Texas, no one's been saying that. Uh, it was the same sequence in Texas as was happening in, 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 in New England. And the third thing we have as a problem is over-dependence on the neighbors. Now, in New England, the problem is over-dependence on, uh, uh, on Canada, which has a lot of hydropower just north of us. I mean, if I go straight north, I, I hit Quebec. And I, I live in Vermont. And if I go straight north, I hit Quebec, the Quebec province, and they have a lot of hydro. So we depend on it. But we, we don't get it in cold weather because they need it. When, when the chips are down, a, a power company will take care of their own uh, area first. They will not be exporting power. Uh, and uh, there's a lot in my book about how I had noticed that Quebec didn't send us enough, uh, about half a much power in a cold snap. And when I really began to see what they had promised to send us, it was half as much as they usually send us because they need, sometimes they need it. So how, let's go, instead of uh, all this depressing stuff, let's talk about three ways that nuclear energy supports a grid. Base load power, over a year of fuel stored on site, and traditional cost uh, support for grid operations. Uh, and and uh, so these are three ways that a nuclear plant supports your grid. So let's go to base load power first. If you are talking to someone who is uh, saying renewables can do it all, they will tell you that. Uh, Baseload is your grandfather's grid. Nobody needs it anymore. All we need is flexible backup, which is usually natural gas, because that's what's called a fast acting resource. You can turn it on quickly. And uh, that's all we need. Baseload's old. Baseload's so, so last century. No, it isn't. This is a picture I have of the fundamental issue for all grids. And this is, I, I took this picture from our ISO New England uh, 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 website and it's from 2016 because they're, they revised the website and I don't think the newer pictures are as pretty, but don't worry, I have new pictures from a different website pretty soon. So what do we have here? We have that at, 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 at zero hours at midnight, there's only 11 gigawatts of uh, uh, demand on the grid. Uh, and at three in the morning, there's only 10 gigawatts. 
But then at six in the morning, oh boy, people are turning on, they're getting up, they're turning on their lights, their the equipment in factories is beginning to hum uh, with, a, you know, uh, and so forth. And uh, then uh, or somewhere around uh, 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 11 at night, uh, it's falling off very rapidly. So, so you see that there's a variable demand on the grid over a course of a day. Now, one of the things I did with the engineering students, and I'll just, I won't take the time to, to play with it here, but I'll say, so anybody ever read the book, uh, uh, How to Lie with Statistics? Very interesting little book. At any rate, what is the, now ISO New England is not trying to lie here. They're just trying to save space. But what is the intrinsic lie in this, this diagram? It doesn't go down to zero. It doesn't go down to zero. The fact is that 10 gigawatts is required all the time on the grid. It's required all the time. And so this business of going up to 16 during part of the day, it looks like, oh, we've got a variable grid here, but we have that base load, which is down there at the 10 gigawatt level. So the next slides uh, are going to be um, two slides about New York state power. Uh, and what, what happened here is that in general, there is this, this idea, oh my goodness, there's something in the chat. Should I be? Oh, okay, I don't have to worry about it. Sorry. Um, uh, the, uh, the, um, I'm going to ignore the chat now. Sorry, I didn't mean to, to do this. This, uh, this uh, slide was put together by a friend of mine, uh, Isaru Saruro, because he, the grid operator will not show you a slide showing base load. They just don't do that, as I showed you in the earlier picture. But he put together uh, the, the electricity for uh, the New York City zone uh, for a full year, January 1, 21 to December 21. Okay. And he, and, and New York city, uh, uses, uh, uh, five gigawatts when it's not using much power and a, and almost nine gigawatts when it's using a lot of power in the summer, uh, air conditioning season. So here's a jagged view of it, but you do notice that he take, he takes the picture down to zero. So you can see that basically around four to five, uh, uh, between three and four uh, gigawatts are in use all the time. That's the base load. And if you're trying to build that base load out of solar, you got a problem at night. If you're trying to build it out of wind, you got a problem. So you're always backing up with natural gas in that situation. Every, uh, there was a beautiful little clip that's been around on some of our nuclear sites of Robert F. Kennedy Jr. saying, Every solar plant is a gas plant. He was speaking to a bunch of people who were uh, putting a, a, gas, a, a gas audience at that point. He wouldn't have done that if he had been speaking to an environmental audience, of course. <laughs> okay, no cynicism, Meredith. Okay, the next thing I wanted to show you is you might say, well, that's lovely, Meredith. You're showing a city. You're showing an air conditioning load. Give me a break. What about the whole thing? Now, New York State is a very varied place. Upstate is very rural. Uh, uh, upstate is, is apple country. It's farming country. Uh, down uh, in New York City, of course, wow, it is not... Uh, not rural, everyone would agree, it's not rural. So what my friend Isiro Sumanro put did was he went to each of the zones in New York State. And I don't, I don't, uh, the capital zone is Albany. The uh, Genesee zone is, 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 is uh, uh, upstate uh, places like uh, uh, Rochester or Syracuse. Uh, uh, Central is, is, is more rural. Um, uh, Hudson Valley is more rural. Uh, and uh, of course, here's New York City, the, the big giant. 
Well, he, what he did was he divided the electricity use into 24 hour demand, 365 demand and variable demand. This is demand. This isn't anything to do with how it's supplied. And look at this. Every, every place is between 55 and 69% uh, 24 seven demand. That is what we call base load. And that is what your nuclear plant can provide you with. Uh, and uh, so when anybody says uh, we don't need nuclear because we don't need base load, just, just think about this. This is a, it took him time to put this together from the raw data. He got the data from the independent system operator, but this independent system operator isn't going to put this out there. Okay, so let me see if I can go on to the next slide. Who knows? Yes, okay. Uh, what are the things I consider very important in terms of uh, uh, reliability is fuel stored on site. So here's a picture. This is my area a couple years ago during the near miss cold snap. And it shows, uh, it shows uh, well, you know, it's, it gets hard to get your car out. And it was also the weather was uh, pushing. Uh, I live in Vermont. And if I want to buy a plant, I'm supposed to buy a plant that's hardy up to minus 30 degrees. Okay. 30 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, so this is a cold snap where we were getting down to minus 20 degrees like day after day. And I wrote this for our local paper where I said uh, on, on January 6th, the temperature was minus eight Fahrenheit, which is, and it, it, it was minus 15 the next morning. So that's the ex excitement. What, well, what I did was, was our, uh, let's see, our grid operator, uh, made a, uh, was very well aware that, um, very well aware that under these circumstances, our homes are using a great deal of natural gas and the power plants can't get natural gas. So our grid operator uh, made a winter reliability program, which meant that the grid operator partially supported, partially paid for oil to be stored on site at dual fuel plants. Now, oil kept the power grid running during this cold snap. During an ordinary time, we use almost no oil on our New England grid. We have uh, natural gas and uh, we have solar and we have nuclear and we have, uh, and so forth. So we don't use very much uh, oil. During the cold snap, the grid was running on 30% oil because oil is stored on site and you can get it. Now, in all honesty, it was pretty touch and go anyway, because so many plants depend on natural gas and so the grid operator stored oil on site at, a, and this is from their, um, oh, it's called the winter operation report from that time period. Uh, it's from our grid operators report. And it, it gave an example of a specific uh, station. Uh, this station could store nine days of oil on site at the beginning of December, which was before the cold snap really began, it had almost eight days of uh, oil on site. And then the cold snap really kicked in. And as you can see near the end, it had one day of oil on site. So this is what I'm trying to say. When your grid is running 30% oil and you got one day of oil on site, this is what I call a near miss. Uh, and I'm sorry to say, a lot of my book is about the management of the grid. I'm sorry to say that our grid operator shut this program down as being too nice to oil. The RTO grid, uh, I'm sorry, FERC, the 
Federal Energy Research Commission, the federal uh, agency, shut this program down, telling our grid operator that the grid operator was being too sweet to oil and it, it has to be fuel neutral. Um, well, anyway, I wrote a book about this. <laughs> So finally, let's get get away from the EDC of the grid operators and talk about uh, nuclear support for grid operations. And uh, I just want to say that nuclear is a huge supporter of grid operations. Uh, many renewables are inverter braced in base, in base. That is, they make DC energy, and then there's an inverter that turns it into AC energy, which is what we all use. And uh, nuclear is uh, not inverter brace. Now, if you begin asking me very complex questions about this, I will have to step away because I'm not an electrical engineer. So I, I don't want to uh, get too deep into this. But basically, Nuclear can supply what inverters cannot supply, which is inertia. That is, it's got the spinning thing and the, it keeps going. You know, it's not on and off. Uh, an inverter is an on-off switch. And it can support voltage and frequency because of that inertia. And so the, uh, let, me, let me go back to this for a moment here. Uh, nuclear can support voltage and frequency. We had an experience uh, recently where uh, we had some, uh, uh, some wind energy coming onto our grid and the uh, developer uh, was uh, in some sense cutting corners. He, he, in order to get tax credits, he had to get it on by a certain day. So he asked to put it on the grid and the grid operator agreed, but said, you know, we'll be curtailing you a lot because you're inverter based and you haven't put on synchronous condensers. So a couple of years, about a year or so later, he built synchronous condensers, uh, which are basically spinning machines that kind of mimic a, 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 a nuclear plant or a, a oil fire plant. Uh, by uh, providing inertia to the grid and supporting voltage and frequency. So nuclear energy is good for the grid. And uh, that's about it. I, I hope I, I, I hope I, I wanted to try to make up some time. I don't know if I did, but maybe I talked in a mile a minute. I don't know. But at any rate, I just want to say that I'm always happy to hear from you. Here's my book about the grid. And uh, I, uh, I, I, my name is Meredith Angwin, and if you know Meredith Angwin, you can get hold of me all kinds of ways because I'm at Meredith Angwin on Twitter and Meredith Angwin and Gmail and MeredithAngwin.com and at, at my website. So anyway, that, that's basically it, and I will now uh, stop sharing my screen. Well, anyway, thank you, actually. And we will be uh, reading your books uh, online or maybe even buying and getting them. And grid is important in all this area. And by the way, we are in a historical even weeks because uh, just recently we in the interchange and, and, and connections with uh, fully connected with Europe, we, we, we could celebrate. Now we are fully connected and actually it happened uh, just recently. Up until now it was like half uh, connected with uh, Europe and for us it's a very, very important. Now, Kalev, uh, today I think we learned, all of us, that we should reconsider what we know and what we fear of and probably start a kind of new era of what? Explaining to each other. There was a lot of facts, so we are much stronger today, uh, each and every one. We can, we can rely on, on, on science-based uh, uh, facts, but should we now address whom? There were many people in the chat room to talking, okay, that's nice, but come on, uh, we will be not able to explain it uh, easily uh, to the public. So they even said we should restart uh, learning physics from almost uh, experience of the collapse of USSR. That, that was a kind of a, a problem that people don't accept because they are feared, because they don't uh, have enough knowledge. So now we have knowledge. What should we do? 
Yes, indeed, learning is very, very important. Uh, my company is, we are uh, investing also heavily into stipends. And actually for the society as, at large as well, as we have uh, still 1.3 million population in Estonia, 1.9 million population in Latvia, learning and getting educated, being uh, indeed uh, knowledgeable, this makes us strong. Mm. And we, if you are stupid, uneducated, we are weak. Mm. And weak will be conquered, we know that. Yeah. So that is why we, and also in energy questions, what Meredith explained, what others have explained, the biggest challenge when it comes to nuclear energy is really to get educated, to get smart, to utilize that energy, which is the most science-based energy, most knowledge-intense energy, but also the highest value, the highest value creating energy form, uh, value-added value creating energy form, to learn it. And that is the challenge for the, our societies. That is the challenge for our organizations. Are we able to communicate, reach out and, and talk to, to the whole of society? In Estonia, we have had communication or explaining nuclear energy in 60 public schools out of 200. We, our aim is to go achieve every public school in Estonia. And we have people working on that. We're regularly on different media outlets in Estonia. And this is the intensity mm. and the challenge to educate. And if you do that consistently, I showed, we have results. So that is also the challenge in Latvia, the primary challenge to educate your society, your people, and take responsibility. We will, we will, absolutely. And can I ask uh, for you first, and then uh, Andrew for you. Um, sorry, switching to Latvian. Um, so if we are standing here today, it is Wednesday today. So we are standing here in front of the audience. And yesterday, it was a day when the government decided to include solar and wind energy as uh, strategic reserves. So we have understood that probably there will be another iron curtain soon to be uh, falling. And a new law has been drafted. Soon it will be submitted to the cabinet of ministers and parliament for approval. So we have so the new law includes uh, wind energy and solar energy as uh, alternative sources. Uh, alternative sources for reserve power. Shouldn't we include also nuclear power in this list? What do you think? Well, in this conference, we talked a lot about wind and solar energy as well, let's say, unstable and uh, relatively unreliable sources of energy. It's not possible to meet the whole demand of uh, power demand uh, of of power consumption merely by uh, solar and wind energy, as Meredith showed in her uh, presentation. Nuclear energy is uh, is supporting inertia. Inertia is necessary to resume power supply after some breakdowns. In larger power plants, inertia is needed to reinstate uh, frequency after breakdown or idle time. Wind energy or solar energy cannot uh, provide that. That's one thing. Another thing, uh, um, renewables are unstable and they are unpredictable the sun is not shining all the time wind is not blowing all the time and we need to look for other sources of energy to to use it as an alternative reserve that's the reason why european union delegated taxonomy acts stipulate for transit from um, renewables uh, to gas and nuclear energy. So we will also have to do this uh, transfer, this transit. Uh, 
Uh, there's a question uh, to Andre Sternbergs. You are you are a, physic a physicist, so you have heard many things, I guess, and you have uh, suffered quite a lot from the uneducated, uh, well, let's say uneducated uh, opinions of uh, people. Well, you know, you know, all those protesters who say, stop telling us that nuclear energy is green. Yes, it is Brussels that is uh, simply trying to push nuclear energy on us we are going to we are going to go out on streets and we are going to protest the nuclear energy nuclear power and that's what our granddad did during the hippie era and that's what we will do what do you think about this critical attitude by people because well you as a physician the physicist must must uh, uh, well, have a different outlook on people who are really categorical about uh, nuclear energy. Yes, everything a part of nuclear energy. Well, yes, nuclear energy is relatively new. Uh, at first, it was uh, associated to such bad things as atomic bombs or nuclear bombs on Japan, on, uh, on uh, uh, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, then, it, then uh, nuclear uh, issues were related to the uh, Chernobyl uh, catastrophe, also to the disaster in Fukushima. And uh, people simply find it difficult to differentiate the benefits of the nuclear energy from the risk it can cause. Well, we have heard about Germany phasing out uh, nuclear energy. The same applies to Lithuania that uh, at first uh, decided to build a nuclear power plant and then held a popular vote to vote against actually launching it. So I am really jealous of uh, Estonia that is on the way of uh, launching its first uh, nuclear power plant, at least uh, there's a political agreement on that. Well, as uh, to the knowledge in physics, uh, well, physics is just one of the natural sciences. And uh, school children should be engage, engaged, should be made, uh, well, should be should be made interested in the natural sciences and uh, education should be started from early age. As uh, to the renewables used as alternative reserve or strategic reserve, well, probably the 15% as it's now stipulated in law is not enough. And we would have to think of ways how to, how to find a balance, uh, how to find a balance between green energies, uh, energy supply, energy uh, security, meeting uh, the aims uh, in, uh, stipulated or defined in the European Green Agenda. But probably our marketing slogan for nuclear uh, energy could be that nuclear energy is green and we should use it. Running around the schools and explaining the things. So now I ask Andres and you and everyone uh, to join this, but to do it in Latvia in their own schools eh? and to explain it. You know, the arms of Kongi to be you at the doubt because Latvia should follow a doubt, of course. Yeah. Go to Latvia schools and, and, and do it. We got a colleague to take doubts to be comment or some of them, Dear colleagues, there were so many people who who voiced their guesses or who wrote their guesses on why the situation in Latvia is the way it is, why people have so poor knowledge in physics. Well, I actually studied in four different schools and um, well, the quality of physics education was the way it was. It probably could be improved. Uh, think back of how uh, high is the quality of physics education was in your school. Probably all the scientists could help uh, the school faculty. Well, it's not always to be done in school environment. We could also do something similar to, AHA, uh, to what is done in AHA Center in uh, AHA Science Center in uh, Tartu. Uh, we 
could organize special uh, film screenings and cinemas. Uh, films would be dedicated to different to topics of physics. We could go with our uh, education program to schools. Well, schools are definitely what we should target. Yes. Uh, uh, thank, uh, thank you for being so responsive. Thank you for uh, being so uh, willing to act op operatively. Are much stronger, I think, after today. Tad dāmas un kungi, liels paldies. Tiešām, lūdzu, neaizmirstiet linku, kas būs YouTube'ā pieejams. No šīs... Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for participating. Please share the link of this conference. Uh, probably there was somebody who changed his or her mind that during uh, the, uh, the conference and some, there was somebody who could definitely benefit from listening to all this information. More than 300 participants joined uh, the conference uh, to listen to uh, everyone everything. also uh, around the seas. Uh, yes, thank you. Bye. Paldies. Hey, paldies. Paldies, Andri. Paldies. 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 Paldies.